Good evening and welcome everybody to our regular meeting of the Larkspur City Council. Tonight is Wednesday, May 17th. It's 6.32. Allison, could I get a roll call? Here. Council Member Hara. Here. Council Member Way. Here. Mayor Paulson. Here. Uh, let's um, stand and say our Pledge of Allegiance as you're able. Thank you. So we'll move on to item number two on our agenda, which is public comment. And as as always, uh, public comment is for items not on the agenda tonight. And uh, the time for individuals is three minutes. So if you're so inclined, please uh, step up to the mic and tell us your name and where you live. Hi, my name is Ross Asselstein. I'm from San Anselmo. <clears throat> Um, I've been interested in participating in the flood uh, um, control activities for the last 14 years. I was on the flood committee in San Anselmo and big part of some of the opposition of what's happened. Tonight, I'd like to talk about the future. I have a forecast that I think you'll all want to avoid. <clears throat> Let's say right now that it's 2028, and I see this. First, there will be no renewal of the flood fee in 2028. Second, let's run through, through roughly how much each town will have contributed by then. Fairfax, 8 million. San Anselmo, 13 million. Ross, 3 million. Larkspur, 13 million. Unincorporated Marin, 19 million. All the millet money will have been spent or allocated to projects to be completed. Third, as it stands today, the following projects might be completed. The Sunnyside Detention Basin, a pump station in Larkspur in the Hillview neighborhood, a pump station that serves a neighborhood in Ross, and maybe a few are modifying 20 houses in Ross and the demo of a plaza in San Anselmo. Per the prior comments of uh, presentations by Marin County staff, they're going to spend all the money. There will be no money set aside for maintenance in the future. They've told me that twice. More importantly, there'll be real liabilities associated with what has been built. The Sunnyside Basin only uh, affects Fairfax, but in the future, if it's not maintained or doesn't perform as designed, the liability rests on every single parcel in the flood zone. The pump station that serves a neighborhood in Ross, same problem. There's no money to maintain it. If it's not maintained and doesn't work, the liability rests on every single parcel in the flood zone. The homes that are not raised in San Anselmo and Ross that do have flood or water increases, or experience unusual flooding, they may sue. Guess what? The liability rests on every single parcel in the flood zone. The pump station in Larkspur only reduces flooding in one small neighborhood, the Hillview neighborhood. If it's not maintained or does not perform as design, people may sue. I've read that contract. The liability then rests on the town of Larkspur as per an agreement with the flood district. Why do I come here tonight to tell you this story and give you this forecast? Because I think you deserve to know, and the people you represent, you represent deserve to know, the tens of million dollars to spend may have a permanent tale of liability. If you, the people in the dais, make an effort to communicate the post-2028 obligations to your constituency, they'll give you a clear response that almost no one in their right mind would want an open-ended, unfunded liabilities for flooding that is miles from their house. Those citizens would likely ask you to diligently pursue what is fair. The projects built should be assigned to the respective towns. Thank you very much. Uh, in parting, I'll say if if you want advice on this, obviously it would go best through your town attorney. I'm happy to give them information that forms a basis for this. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Ross. Um, next public comment, please. Okay, uh, seeing nobody here in the chambers. Um, Allison, do we have anyone online? You do, yes. Your first public comment will come from caller ending 1402. Okay, welcome, uh, James. James Holmes, Larchburg. Uh, perhaps some council members may recall the longstanding uh, council custom of adjournment in memory of longtime members and others who contributed to the community. On such occasions, the agenda would include a line at the bottom that said adjournment in memory of that, that person's name. 
Uh, as I recall, meetings were adjourned uh, in memory of both my parents and many others over time. If anyone ever uh, warranted adjournment in their uh, memory and an agenda note to that effect, it would be the recently deceased Sandy Blauvelt, longtime Park and Rec Commission member, uh, Larkspur Foundation chair, and contributor in many ways going back to the 70s. And by, by incidentally, she lived in in the late in the late Jerry Garcia's former home just up the street from me. So I would urge that uh, the next meeting be adjourned in memory of Sandy Blauvelt and that the agenda so note. Thank you. Thank you, James. And just as an aside, we we uh, did commemorate her at, at a previous meeting, but I'm happy to do that tonight. I I completely agree. She was such a valued member. Uh, next public comment, please. Next speaker will be Sarah. Welcome, Sarah. Good evening. Um, thank you for the time. My name is Sarah Swigert. I'm a resident of the Drake's Cove area of Larkspur. We're about a half mile east of Marin Country Mart on Sir Francis Drake. I'm here to speak in favor of broad investments in pedestrian and bicycle safety in the Larkspur and Marin areas, and then also specifically um, near my neighborhood. While we can see the bay and see the bay trail and see Marin Country Mart, residents in my community are unable to safely walk to Marin Country Mart. It requires a vehicle drive to go this direction. So while we're residents of Larkspur, we can't fully participate in the beauty and, and wonder right there. Um, there is 0.1 mile that lacks a sidewalk or safe bike lane. Um, this impacts not only my 25 community 25 families, but also the thousands of cyclists that travel from Richmond Bridge into Marin to enjoy Mount Tam, Stinson, all of our bike trails. Um, they are confronted by a confusing and busy roadway on Sir Francis Drake, and I greatly urge us to invest in clearer signage and a protected passageway for pedestrians and bicyclists alike on Sir Francis Drake. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Sarah. Uh, Allison, next speaker. I'm looking for any additional raised hands from our Zoom audience members. There's no further public comment. Okay, so with that, we'll um, move on to the next agenda item, which are presentation presentations, and we have none tonight. Um, so then we can move to item four, which is the approval of the consent calendar. Uh, we have five items tonight. Um, is any Council member wishing to pull an item from the consent calendar? Seeing none, any, anybody in the public wishing to uh, remove an item from the consent calendar? Okay, seeing none, I'll uh, entertain a motion to pass the five items um, on the consent calendar. I'll move passage of the consent calendar. Second. Okay, so council member Way and seconded by council member um, uh, um, sorry, Kevin, Kevin too. <laughs> Kevin, Kevin a second. Um, uh, roll call, Allison, please. Councilmember Carroll. Yes. Councilmember Hara. Yes. Councilmember Way. Yes. Mayor Paulson. Yes. Okay. And with that, we'll move to the city manager's or oral report. Um, I don't have a lot of. Items for you this evening, uh, we'll probably talk a little bit more about this during the budget item, but I wanted to acknowledge that uh, the two uh, public safety joint powers authorities uh, adopted their budgets at their meetings last week, uh, went through rather uh, congenially, congenially? Uh, and, uh, smoothly. Uh, and I also wanted to report out as we did at those meetings for the council, you've seen a lot of coverage that uh, suggested we were already on the verge of merging our fire department, our fire authority with the Ross Valley Fire Department. Well, that's not the case. Discussions are now underway about what we can and can't do, both in the short term and in the long term, um, as agencies that are neighbors. And as you know, fire doesn't recognize jurisdictional boundaries. So um, I think we're starting a really healthy conversation and I anticipate it'll be a topic of many public meetings in the coming uh, months and year. So I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Any questions uh, for the city manager? Okay, great. Um, so then let's uh, go to our 
Council member oral reports and comments. Anybody on the council? It's been a quiet week in Mike Logan, my hometown. Uh, but it, we did have an MC, MC uh, homeless um, committee meeting and score one for Larkspur. Um, in the conversation, I found out that an exciting conversation. Uh, the bus that um, the county sends around to for with portable showers has been driving to Sunnyvale and back to dump the water. And I pointed out that here in the beautiful city of Larkspur, we have a sewer dump. Uh, one of our mobile home parks charges for the service, but I think it's probably less than the gas to drive to Sunnyvale and back. Um, so I recommended that along with, there is one in Sausalito at one of the boat yards and one in Novato, but I think we're more centrally located. So score one for Larkspur. I don't know if we get any sales taxes on that of any kind. And then even better, it doesn't go into our sewer system. It goes into Corte Madera sewer system. So it's a real rich man's tactic of getting somebody else to pay for and profiting off of their uh, system. So. I'm very proud of that. Um, and that's all I have to report. All right, thank you. Uh, and I just want to say briefly that this Saturday is uh, a great fire safety event, probably one of the biggest of the year, Ember Stomp. Uh, it's at the Marin Fairgrounds. It's Saturday. It starts in the morning and runs all day long. Anybody interested, just just Google Ember Stomp or you know, Ember Stomp Marin Fairgrounds. And it's a good way to get educated. It's a good way to have some fun. Um, I'm going to be there, and I hope I see some of you there. 11 to 5. 11 to 5. Thank you. Um, okay, so then let's move on to the next item, which is a public hearing. Um, the amending... Oh, I'm sorry. I cancel... No, I see. You're, you're good. Okay. Uh, so item number seven is the, a public hearing amending the fee schedule of the city of Larkspur. Uh, could we get a staff report, please? Mr. Mayor and Council Members, at your last meeting, we held a workshop to go over the proposed amendments to this year's fee schedule, as outlined in your report. Um, the most notable change, other than the sort of standard increase to recognize CPI, is that we're transitioning our planning and building uh, operations, our community development department, to a number of flat fee arrangements. We feel that that is warranted after having had our consultant analyze the department's operations and the amount of administrative time that was going into our current deposit approach. And so uh, we would ask that you uh, take up the matter of adopting this fee schedule so that it'll be in place for the new fiscal year. And um, I'm gonna remind you that our consultant is Terry Madsen, who's uh, on the line here. And Terry, I don't know if you have any comments you wanna add. Uh, in case you no. Didn't know, so he's available <laughs> for questions. And with that, Mr. Mayor, I'll turn it back to you. Great, thank you, uh, Dan. Um, so welcome, Terry. Uh, we Thanks. did go over this in, in some detail last meeting. Uh, do any council members have any further questions on the fee schedule? Okay, so let me just uh, turn it over to the public one last time. Any public comments, any thoughts on amending our fee schedule for the city? I'm looking for any raised hands from our Zoom audience members. And there's no public comment. Okay, um, so I uh, would entertain a motion to approve resolution 2323 to adopt the proposed amendments. I'd like to make that motion. Okay. I'll second. Great, so uh, Kevin and Kevin, and uh, could we get a roll call? Yes. Council Member Hara? Yes. Council Member Way? Yes. Mayor Paulson? Yes, great, so it passes unanimously. Okay. Now let's move on to our business items. Uh, tonight we're talking about the fiscal year 2023-2024 uh, uh, budget. And I guess we'll start off with the departmental uh, department level updates. Um, so Dan, you wanna take it away? Yeah, so this evening we're gonna um, do more of our workshop format, discussion format about next year's budget. Um, we've often spread this over multiple meetings. We're condensing a lot of it in light of some of the other things that are going on with the council uh, agenda lately. Um, 
The first item we'll take up in a moment is the department level updates. This has always been one of our fun items. We get to have our department heads come and kind of talk about what they've accomplished in the current fiscal year and what they're hoping to accomplish in the upcoming fiscal year. Um, we'll then roll up our sleeves. We've given you a lot of numbers to start to dig into on the uh, preliminary budget. Strong emphasis in that item will be on the general fund. And then lastly, uh, you'll hear from Public Works Director Julian Skinner about next year's capital improvement program. Uh, but we'll start with our department level updates. Um, and I said, this is a chance to sort of celebrate what we're doing and what we wanna to try to tackle in the coming year. So each of the department heads is here to make a very brief presentation or summary or comments, depending on uh, what they've elected to do. And I think this year, I see Kathy. So Kathy, you get to go first. <laughs> So Kathy Orm is the Administrative Services Director. Um, the Administrative Department is a shared responsibility for Kathy and me. I think she'll be putting probably a strong emphasis on the finance operations within the Administration Department. Okay. I put together a very fun little last presentation I'm doing for Aww. the budgets for you. So I thought it would be fun to do past and present, like for where we had been and what we've accomplished and just very quickly, um, just, here we go. <clears throat> so when we started, we had a lot of files. We were going to, we updated our files, we updated the payroll files. We <clears throat> are now sending, most of our invoices are now being sent and our AP files are being scanned, so we're having less of the files. Personnel files, not so much, but uh, our APs are being scanned. And we also were date stamping. That was a big thing. We had date stamp our invoices when they come in, and now we're receiving a lot of our invoices by email, so that is a date stamp. But we, this was um, a slide that I used back in, I don't know, 2014. <laughs> There's nothing more fun than slapping a stamp on a piece of paper. <laughs> so <clears throat> I don't know if you everybody remembers the slide credit card machines, but we still have one over here in a, in a drawer somewhere. And we moved to the chip reading and now we've actually added online payments. So we've come a long ways as far as how we can pay and allowing our people to pay online, even through eTracket. They can do it on the weekends. So it's it's a big, big jump in the last 10 years. <clears throat> We've also gone from printing checks, it's a cost-saving measure, to doing offering EFT payments to a lot of our vendors. And in the near future, we will have a, <clears throat> a deposit scanner. So we can they'll save us from going to the bank. We'll be able to recognize our deposits on a more timely basis and we can do it right from our desktops. So this is coming soon. For your cell phone. <clears throat> um, more seriously to look at, we have audits. Everybody, I'm always saying, <clears throat> I'm in audit, I'm in audit, I'm in audit. Well, here are some of the audits that we go through. We've, oh, this, these are, some of them are annual, some of them are biannual, but for the most part, our books, if you go out for a grant, you're going to get an audit. So they've been clean. We've been good. We track our monies. So when I say, well, I'm in audit all the time, this is why. <clears throat> but the audits have led to clean books. So here's a look at the property tax, like in the last 10 years. So you can see how it has grown and it has been substantial for us and our budgets to fund us because this is our main <clears throat> source of revenue. Our second main source of revenue is our sales tax. And our sales tax is growing quite well, right up until you can see in 2020, of course it tanked. And now it's actually on a rebound. And if you look at our budget for um, this year, we were very conservative, but we're gonna hit the $3 million mark. So we're, we're, I think that will steady out at 3 million. And <clears throat> HDL is saying that the 
sales tax will start to soften a little bit with the increasing prices and inflation that's upon us. But I think that we will see a flattening of three, and I don't think it'll go up to the, our highest marks at you know 3.4. It was really growing for a while. We're like, this is crazy. <clears throat> This is a look at the general fund fund balance and how we've grown it over the years. So all of these are such positive signs for this, a very healthy general fund. And we have a, I have a lot to thank council for being very conservative and allowing me to be very conservative in, in the revenue numbers and in our expense controls and not overspending or spending on everything and keeping to living within our means has been our motto. So with that, the only thing that hasn't changed in all these 10 years is the uh, finance department. The We're still all together. Evan. And that <clears throat> concludes my quick little where we've been presentation. I'll just note, Kathy alluded to the biggest challenge, which is that we have a looming transition. Kathy's leaving us at the end of the year to enjoy the next phase of, of life and, and stop, stop at least working for us. So uh, she, when she retires, we'll need to uh, have a transition in place and we're actually working actively to do that. And I wanna thank the council you authorized uh, previously that we would program into the budget some overlap so that, uh, Kathy's successor could be hired and they'd have some months together to smooth over that transition. So I want to report we're on track for that. I'm very optimistic we'll have an announcement in the next month or so. And hopefully a going away party. That'll come later, <laughs> but yes. <laughs> I, I like a chart uh, on page 10 or chart 10, because this is the time Kevin and I, Kevin uh, to my right has been on the, um, Council since 2013, and look, we've we've uh, we've we've had the leadership during a very nice time. Yes, absolutely. We can thank, thank that entirely to you and me. <laughs> uh, it's just a question about yes. sales tax. Yes. That three million that you think we're hitting—that's both internet sales tax and brick and mortar. <clears throat> yes, that is for that. It's the Bradley Burns one percent sales tax that we get. That's oh. what I'm reporting on. Yeah, it has nothing to do with uh, Measure B money. And I just want to uh, kind of repeat, I think last time we were thanking you and creating top 10 lists of why we thanked you, but, but for getting us through COVID and the budget book was, was very helpful. So, so again, many thanks. You're welcome. All right. Okay. Well, uh, let's have our newest department head come up. Nick, why don't you come up next? So this is Nick Stone, our recreation director, uh, who might highlight a few things for the library because he's been pulling double duty lately. Good evening. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about recreation and then afterwards I'll, I'll talk a little bit about library and take questions for both. Um, so this was the first year that kind of felt like we were getting back to normal um, uh, post pandemic and um, not so much in the beginning part of the year, but but towards the end, it's really feeling like we're um, picking up programming and, and really getting back to it. We started in-person programming again after school at both um, all right, there we go. Uh, at both Basage and Hall and then also in Piper as well. And um, we have a theater, a very successful theater program, Conte and Company. Uh, we've had for years and, and programs were immensely popular before COVID and then just you know, completely stopped. And when we started up again earlier this year, the numbers were really low. And uh, and she worked really hard to bring those numbers back up. And she is now skyrocketing past where where we were in 2019. So I think it's uh, just a testament to how much people are really excited to be back in person. <clears throat> we also started our Basage Kinder Camp again. That was in August last year, and we'll be doing it again this year. And that's an incoming camp for incoming kindergartners at Basage. And we had 50 little kindergartners last year, and I think we're on pace for about 65 this year. And um, events, 
And one of my one of my favorite events came back this year, the flashlight egg hunt that we did at Piper Park. Uh, that was last month. And I think picture didn't make it, but uh, we had about 500 attendees uh, in Piper Park. Uh, we had a timer that counted down for about an hour. And at 8.30, say about 8.29, um, there was about two or 300 kids that just uh, completely mobbed Piper Park and with their, their flashlights. And we had 6,000 eggs out there. And no joke, they were picked up within 10 minutes. Um, and uh, they st stuck around for another 40 minutes or so, um, just just making sure. But it was a, a really great community event. And I, I can't say how much I love being back. And I was really nervous about it, but um, but it really went went so well. Uh, then the next morning, we went out to Puerto Madera to Town Park, where we partner with Puerto Madera to do the spring egg hunt. We had 11,000 eggs. Uh, out there at town park and because of the the tightly mowed grass and the uh the daytime i think that was over under <laughs> under two minutes <laughs> yeah and we, those are uh candy stuffed plastic eggs yeah and we have um a ton of volunteers out there that uh, uh teen volunteers and preteen volunteers that uh that walk around and make sure that every kid leaves with a with a handful of eggs even if they came late or if they weren't quick enough um everybody gets to find eggs out there. Um, we are going to be bringing back music in the park. We haven't done it since 2019. So, and so, and, um, we'll get to the date for the dates for those. We're going to have four dates, um, at Piper park and, um, just very excited to be back. It was such a fun event. Um, and we're going to do that in, um, in partnership with Larkspur community foundation. And um, they hosted an event last year in Piper Park, and we're really excited to, to expand on what they did last year. And finally, night lights in Piper Park. Um, Your slides aren't advancing here. Oh, there they go. There you go. Yeah. Um, these pictures are there, yeah. So we had um, night lights at Piper Park. We had 24 trees lit up this year. Um, the single, I think, greatest event I've I've done. Uh, I had absolutely no complaints, and people just loved it. And I feel like I'm constantly meeting people in the community that are saying, "Oh, are you the are you the lights guy?" Um, <laughs> so I didn't do the work, but um, but I'm, I'm I'm really proud of it, and I hope that that you guys have uh, have gotten the accolades that that you deserve for for making something like this happen. So. Oh, there's the pictures. Yeah. <laughs> so up above, you see the flashlight egg hunt and um, and down below some some lights for the holidays. And the lights, I should mention, too, were uh, in partnership with the, the Commons Foundation. It was expressed interest in doing it again this year. And so we're going to hopefully expand on on lights in the park next year. Uh, goals for this year are to expand um, partnerships with community groups. I think it's it's been a great experience. and um, People are really ready to be back and and doing events and to help with programming. Everywhere I go, I feel like people are saying, "What can we do to help?" Um, so that's one of the goals is to get these groups uh, more involved. I would like to build up programming to the pre-pandemic levels. It's been slow. A lot of um, instructors have retired over the last few years, and so I'm trying to bring back uh, programs um, responsibly and and so enough that we can we can manage what we have. And so I, I think in the next couple of years, we'll really, really expand programming here. One of the the big things I, I see it at all the events is that we have so many people willing to volunteer. And mm -hmm. so I really want to come up with programming um, that helps our our middle school and high school volunteer base to to come out. It's I do the flashlight egg hunt and I, I immediately sell out the the volunteer list uh, within a few hours. So more of that kind of stuff, I, I think, is going to be much needed. And finally, the the big project coming up is um, I'm working with Public Works, and we're going to um, revamp the Piper Park Master Plan. Mm -hmm. As we as we kind of go through that, there were things when it was done, I think, 10, 11 years ago, that were not even on people's radars back mm -hmm. then. Uh, Pickleball is one of the ones that keeps coming up. So, um, so back back then it wasn't wasn't on anybody's radar, and so now we're gonna look to um, put it back out to the public and and see what they want now. And that's 
I just want to volunteer yeah. that that um, the age friendly committee would love to help you figure out how to incorporate age friendly um, when you're looking at that when you're looking at the master plan as far as age friendly benches or activities or signage or um, uh, supplies anything like that that if you want that is a resource um, the age friendly workshops and workbooks have a whole thing of park master plan for age friendly perspective. Wonderful. I'd be happy to share them with you. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, just uh, I want to thank you, Nick. I think the lights, they're all you. Uh, I say that's the Nick Stone show. <laughs> so good job there. And and I was curious about the pickleball because I know before COVID that was really, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear. I'm, I'm just a couple questions. One is um, on the music, I know Corte Madera has a really well-developed program, and I, I was so happy to see us do something in the summer. Um, and, you know, the Larkspur Community Foundation, you know, a couple of the people were there. Uh, is there any way to share resources with them? Because they they seem to have a pipeline of musicians and, you know, they have some people who are halfway in the industry. And I, I mean, I, I think maybe it would just you know, uh, give you a boost or be a, a form of, of support and partnership? Yeah, absolutely. We we actually um, always have open conversations with Corte Madera and, and I, I tried to poach a couple of their musicians this year and it didn't, uh, schedule wise, didn't work out. They they do a Sunday afternoon show and, and we do a Friday evening show. So, so it usually works. It didn't work out this year, um, but um, let's be honest, a lot of what we do in recreation is uh, borrow from other from other departments and 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 see what's been successful for them and 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 borrow it yeah <laughs> i like that word and um just a very minor question the gardens in piper park is that something that that you're um overseeing as well yes and can yes. you say a little bit about that because i i know that that's been a hit for a long time and i'm wondering post-covid and you know if there's any chance to expand you know the space there or, or how, how that's working I think we're pretty built out on space. Um, you know, we there is an ex, uh, a long wait list. Um, the, the wait list is about three to four years right now. So, so people that are that are getting into the garden have been on the wait list for three to four years. Um, Stephen Connor has has been the garden coordinator for forty one years now, and um, and and runs it runs a tight ship. Tight ship. It is. Um, it looks amazing out there. And if you ever want a tour, um, happy to take you out there. And, and Stephen would love to have you out. Okay, great. Any other questions? Yeah, a uh, couple things. Um, I've had one inquiry about this, and that was, will the dog park have lights for the wintertime? Does people get home after six o'clock? And... Um, no, that is not in the plan. Okay, now I have my answer. <laughs> uh, and then the second thing is, I did notice uh, we included the park and rec in the Corte Madera brochure this year. And it, uh, a lot of my neighbors just tossed it because they thought it was a mass mailing, which we get a lot of mass mailings that are intended for Corte Madera in Larkspur, you know, in our mailboxes. And um, it, there really wasn't anything on the cover to indicate your stuff was in the back of it. And so it got missed. And I just, you know, hopefully next year, I think it's a good idea to combine with them you know, in, in the single brochure, but I think it's, it's just, we need a better uh, way to communicate that our stuff is in there. Yes, I apologize. That was actually, this year was, um, that was actually just a Corte Madera brochure that they had some extra pages in yeah. at the end. That was, oh, it's a great money saver. I love yeah. that idea, but you know. <laughs> so we're going to be looking at, um, it's one of the things that I was hoping to bring back this year, but but I, I do plan to bring back next year is, is um, a guide. We're looking at options to, to to run one with our library with the Larkspur library and then we'll also look at options with with Corte Madera uh, like we used to okay and then the other thing um I've had a couple of people in with inquiries about rental space for meetings there's an ongoing problem with the Drake's Landing uh, space which wasn't advertised in it. And I don't know if this is a, something for Park and Rec or if this is something maybe to be done through the chamber of some kind of combined list of um, available event spaces within the city limits of Larkspur. Because um, I noticed a couple of communities, they have combined lists where they list both public 
facilities and private facilities with the sizes of the crowds that they can handle and types of events they can handle. I'm just curious if that's something we could develop. I think if you want to send me some examples of cities so I can find out, we tend to shy away from what might appear as the promotion of private resources. So, but if you could send me some samples so I can see what other cities are doing, we can look into that. Okay, thank you. I can tell you the only space we have is actually a small room in the rec facility that's booked all the time. So we don't have a lot of space. Well, I've been kind of looking around and I noticed like the Krupp Center. Um, uh, yeah. Set up for Zoom. I, again, I, 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 I can ask the school district if that's something they want us to do. Yeah. We can do that. Thank you. Hey, Nick, did you lose any more trees? There's two down in the park uh, in Piper. Um, I not, guess not since the last. Okay. Part. Uh, and I believe those have been mostly cleaned up now. There's there's still big craters from from when they they went down. But but I think um, I think uh, Public Works had had crews yeah. come out to clean those up. It was interesting the the big um, I think it was a pine in the roots in that big crater. You could see the. The, the debris from when that was the city dump. I thought it was a really interesting history there. You could see it in the roots of the trees. Fence boards. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, all right. Okay, great. I think that's it. So um uh we will move on. Thanks, move Nick. Move on. Thanks, Nick. Yeah. Do you want to do a library or oh sorry, I forgot you're doing a library. Oh, double duty. Yeah. <laughs> I even said it earlier. Okay, go ahead. Um so mine is um, a little bit shorter for the library because I'm, I'm not as well well versed in everything. But um, I really want to commend the the library staff on on how easy they've been to work with. Um, it's been a, a tough transition for them. Uh, not you know I I know nothing about what they do, and over the last six months I've learned as much as I can, and it's still just a fraction of what of what they do. Um, and uh, some of their accomplishments this year, you know, is is you know, hardworking as they are, and they're always constantly busy. They're always trying to expand, um, so they're 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 constantly looking for new programming for for youth and adults. Um, we hired a new librarian uh, a few months ago, and and immediately hit the ground running, and and uh, started up a friendship club for for people, which is kind of a modified uh, book club. Um, Teresa is back up at the Tamil Pius, um, doing book club up at the at, at the community up there. And um, we've also increased uh, the operating hours to five days a week. Uh, I think we were closed uh, doing mostly curbside service um, until this year. And um, yeah. And so we're gonna be transitioning to a, a new library director in the next month. And uh, we're excited for that. I think the big, Big things that that they're going to be doing here is is really working on um, programming for the new building and and just trying to create a strong culture um, as as we open the new building uh, a few years down the road. Um, any questions? Like the new chairs. Should have mentioned the chairs donated by the friends of the library. All right. Well, yeah. No, more. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nick. Um, why don't we have Julian go next? Julian Skinner, our public works director. Uh, good evening. Uh, so tonight I have a brief presentation uh, because you'll see me again later for the capital improvement program. So I'll try not to be uh, repetitive. Um, so I'm going to start with our uh, public works uh, accomplishments this year, kind of a report card, and then um, our goals for the upcoming year. Uh, so as you've seen before, uh, public works looks after your streets, uh, city buildings, um, and the city parks. Um, we're divided into two divisions, um, engineering, which um, looks at bigger projects, uh, and private projects. So if somebody comes in with a private project and it's going to touch or impact city facilities, such as a street, right away storm drains, then we do uh, the review there to make sure that everything conforms with, with our codes. And then our maintenance crew that do our routine 
um, day to day maintenance. And currently, uh, staffing we have uh, two engineers on staff, a technician, two analysts, and an inspector. Or we have an inspector position. It's covered right now with a a, a contractor. As we've uh, had challenges recruiting uh, for that. Uh, one of our engineers, um, as you'll see later in the budget presentation, uh, was originally hired under a four-year limited term connected with the additional uh, capital project work that we had associated with the Bonaire Bridge. Uh, well, now with the new library and uh, the storm drain projects, uh, we've determined that we still have the need for that additional position. And so uh, we're proposing with this budget to convert that limited term position into uh, a full-time um, our other engineer that's on staff, I'm happy to say, uh, recently passed uh, the last of the examinations that are required to become a professional licensed engineer in California. So um, Alvin Tan, for uh, those of you that know him, uh, will, as soon as his paper comes in the mail, be a licensed civil engineer. So we're really proud of Alvin. That's a great professional uh, development accomplishment uh, for him. Um, and then I'll move on to um, our project. So um, again, um, I'm copying the goals from last year and, and showing you how we progressed on those throughout the year. So the biggest project, the Bonaire Road Bridge, was finally uh, completed. Uh, you'll be seeing in the next meeting or so, we'll actually bring an official notice of completion to you, which is part of um, what we're required to do in order to notify all the subcontractors, make sure they all get paid, and then uh, finally do all the, the accounting closeout. Um, with Caltrans on that project. So that's why it's 99%, not 100, just because we've got the final paperwork to finish up. Uh, Measure B Group 4 paving, uh, we made it about 80% of the way through that project, and then we ran into some environmental constraints and a handful of streets. And so uh, we're working with the resource agencies to get clearance on those environmental conditions. Uh, and as soon as those are clear, we'll uh, resume paving all of those streets um, and then we will have, once those are uh, completed, we will have paved all of the streets in the program except for one. Unfortunately, uh, Monte Vista and the little piece of King right next to a City Hall, um, there's a PG&E gas line that needs to be relocated. Uh, they're about a year out from doing that project. So unfortunately, uh, that street's going to slide, but all the other streets in the Measure B program will be finished as soon as we clear this environmental hurdle this, this summer. Uh, we completed uh, paving of East Sir Francis Drake. Uh, that was all done at night due to uh, traffic uh, conditions. Uh, we completed the undergrounding on Doherty Drive. Um, so all of the overhead lines that remained on Doherty uh, have been undergrounded now and the poles have uh, been removed. Um, here's some slides of the bridge. Uh, picture on the right is kind of halfway through construction. Um, and then on the left is uh, the completed bridge. Um, and here's our Doherty Drive project that we completed. This is a before and after. So as you remember, uh, the picture on the left here was a narrow sidewalk next to a fence. And so um, school children and other people walking on Doherty were walking on a narrow sidewalk um, against traffic next to, a, next to a fence that was also leaning in some places and had some vegetation on it and uh, provided a, a challenge. And so um, this project we just completed, in addition to repaving all of Doherty, uh, with the undergrounding of the utility poles, as I mentioned previously, we were then able to build a, an eight-foot wide path behind the sidewalk to provide room for cyclists and pedestrians, um, and that completed a gap in our uh, Safe Routes to Schools uh, facilities on Doherty Drive. Uh, and this is a photo of night paving on um, East Sir Francis Drake. Uh, and then the next group of project, I already mentioned Doherty Drive. We also repaved Magnolia Avenue from city limit to city limit. Um, most of that was done in the summer to avoid school traffic. And then um, the northern end of it was done at night, uh, again, due to um, traffic conditions. Uh, we were able to advertise and award a, a contract for the five Bonaire mitigation projects. So you've probably seen out in uh, Piper Park, the dog park construction is underway and actually almost uh, complete. Um, there's additional work to come in Piper Park, including converting the old dog park into um, back into Tidal Marsh. And then right now you'll see them out on Magnolia and they're widening the ditch on uh, Magnolia just north of Doherty. And that's to provide uh, an additional uh, ditch area to clean stormwater so that when the stormwater comes through our system, it goes into that ditch before it goes to the creek, 
uh, that ditch is being widened and being lined with the kind of plants that filter sediment out of stormwater to give the water a chance to get clean before it gets out into the creek. Um, and then we move on to a couple of projects that uh, we're a little bit behind on the Elm Avenue upper pathway. So um, this project looks to uh, put some staircase and improve some conditions um, on a pedestrian path that connects upper and, and lower um, Elm so folks don't have to uh, walk the long way around on a narrow street. Um, and when we went through the preliminary design, we found out that we didn't have enough money uh, budgeted. So we've done some value engineering. Um, and we, one of the things you'll see in the capital program is a request to add some money into that project so we can get it uh, finished. And then the Marina Lagoon gate uh, replacement, working with a consultant, that consultant got uh, or merged or uh, combined with another consultant. And so we've been working with some contractual issues, but now we're back on track uh, to get the gates uh, replaced out of the lagoon. Here's picture on the left is uh, during construction, almost completed the new dog park. So uh, most of the dog park is going to be grass where the dogs run. And then there's kind of a transition area that's decomposed granite. And then where most of the foot traffic is expected to be, where people are coming in and out is going to be pavers. So it will uh, stand up better. And there's I think there's about eight benches uh, scattered throughout the new uh, dog park. Um, over on the right is Bonaire Landing Park that's out on South Elysio, again, during construction photos. So completely redoing the access down to the public dock so that it's ADA accessible. Um, that project's actually also uh, almost completed. They're working on the, the planting now, and I think we've just got the handrails to go in. Um, and then later this summer, they'll be replacing the dock with an ADA compliant dock. Um, and again, here's just old dog park on the left, new dog park on the right. Um, and then so um, again, the third set of projects here, phase two of the crosswalk improvements, we got about halfway through. Um, and then we identified some locations where um, we need additional uh, lighting, uh, not street lighting, but more pedestrian scale lighting for some of these crosswalks. And so again, you'll see in the capital program, we're proposing budgeting some Transportation Authority of Marin money to help us um, improve some of those crosswalks. Uh, we did complete the retrofit of all the streetlights in the city. So they're all LED fixtures now, uh, which means that our PG&E bill drops in about half and also our maintenance bills are gonna drop uh, down about half. So um, that project costs about $300,000 and we should recoup that money back in about four and a half years with those uh, savings. Um, and then we worked with uh, building and planning uh, community development department to help uh, implement the new uh, eTrackit software that uh, Kathy Orm spoke about that we're using for our encroachment permits um, and public works and also with the uh, review we do of uh, building permits. Uh, Storm drain master plan, 99% uh, percent complete. We're just waiting for the final version to come back signed for the consultant, but we presented to you a few months ago. Um, and it was adopted and we're moving forward now with uh, some of the projects that were recommended in that plan. Um, the future paving plan for what we're going to do with the streets after Measure B is complete. Uh, we're a little bit behind on that, uh, mainly because of the postponement in the Measure B streets. So we didn't want to go out and do another set of streets this year. So we're going to finish the rest of the Measure B this summer. And then the first year of kind of our maintenance plan, we'll see streets getting paved or slurried or whatever treatment uh, we determine after we do our analysis will be uh, next summer. So uh, we're about halfway through. Um, and then initiating the next phase of the North-South Greenway. So um, Tam and Caltrans worked on uh, the new bridge over Corte Madera Creek that sits next to the freeway off-ramp. Um, and that uh, path lands now on Old Redwood Highway about where the chicane is. Uh, so uh, Tam has been working on the project design for the next phase that will take that path down to the pedestrian overcrossing, uh, roughly around where Industrial Avenue is on Old Redwood Highway. Um, and as a city, we will be managing that project when it goes into construction. Um, that project's all ready to go. It's sitting on a desk or two over at Caltrans waiting for somebody to check the box because it has now some federal funding in it. Um, and as soon as we get that uh, box checked, it'll go out to bid and hopefully we'll get that uh, pathway completed uh, before next winter. Um, and then following in on that, um, as we complete that phase of the North-South Greenway, uh, we are looking to see what pedestrian and bicycle improvements we could do to the remainder of Old Redwood Highway. Um, so there was a planning effort that started on that about seven or eight years ago and it, uh, got, it got put on hold. 
um, due to lack of funding. Uh, but we're anticipating that with the completion of the north section of the uh, north-south greenway, there may be some more demand from the public for improved uh, bicycle and ped uh, pedestrian uh, continuity in that area. So uh, we'll be doing a little bit more public engagement on uh, improvements in that area. Uh, this is a result of our paving program. I put this together actually about a month ago, so it's a little out of date, uh, but it shows a progression in our PCI, which is our pavement index um, over the years, starting with 2018 when we first started with the Measure B. We're down at a 53 out of 100. This shows that when I ran this, we were at an 85. This was before we paved South Elysio. Uh, it's now at, a, I just ran the calcs the other day. Our PCI is now at an 87. Um, and we still have a few streets to go. I don't know if we'll make it to 90, but uh, we'll be pretty close. But anything above 80 uh, is, and we're going to be in good shape as far as uh, uh, it being able to sustain financially maintaining our streets in the future. Um, goals for next year. So the first one is to continue all of those projects that I showed you that weren't at 100% still need some work. So that's closing out the mitigation projects. So the rest of the uh, group four streets. Uh, and then down at the bottom, some new projects, as I mentioned, from the storm drain master plan, we've got two sets of projects now to go out and uh, repair, replace and line some of our storm drains. Um, and then uh, work on our first pump station replacement, which is um, Heather Gardens. Um, and then also some upgrades at the other pump stations. Uh, we're working now, we have an RFQ out on the street for a uh, design build contractor for the new library at the Commons. Um, and then it, we're also going to be looking uh, doing an RFQ, RFP for an architect structural team to look at options for uh, renovating this building. Um, rebuilding Dolliver Park, as you know, um, a street tree fell down in a storm and wiped out the new improvements. So uh, we'll be looking at replacing those. Um, and then uh, as we finish paving all of our streets, it's painfully obvious that the Piper Park parking lot is in horrible shape. So uh, we'll be looking at putting some uh, funding ideas together to repave that that parking lot. Um, you approved a park sign um, program um, a few years ago, and we did a few park signs. And so we think it's time now to roll out the rest of them. So we're looking at funding that. And then we're always working on shared services agreements with um, other agencies, other public works departments to see if we have common needs and if there's a way to um, share those uh, efficiently. Um, here's unfortunately the tree that fell on Dolliver and then an example of our uh, park signs. Um, here on the right is the new section of the latest section of North South Greenway that was built and on the left is kind of where the extension of that will come to on Old Redwood Highway. Um, I didn't, didn't mention Niven because it's an ongoing pre-funded project, but we do have an upcoming exciting park mm -hmm. renovation, playground renovation in Niven that you've already approved the plans for and that'll be going out to bid this summer. And then, as I mentioned before, um, options of what we can do with this building and then uh, looking at building the new library over at the Commons. Uh, quick mention of some of the maintenance tasks. So they did a lot of work this year, a lot of storm response. As you recall, we had seven back to back to back um, atmospheric rivers earlier this year, which was really a, a really a challenge for them. A lot of trees down all over the city. Uh, they've been very proactive with a tree inventory. And so we've been through all of our parks, all of our paths, um, looking at the trees and having their health assessed, and then immediately taking out ones that are identified as immediate threat, and then coming up with a plan to take out kind of the next level of these ones uh, need to come out at some point. Um, then they rolled out the uh, battery powered leaf blowers and experimented with a few other battery powered uh, tools, but they've had most success with the leaf blowers. Uh, potholes are down 85% versus what they were before we started Measure B paving. And then they did a lot of work this year with the irrigation uh, controls, adapting to all of the restrictions we had with Marin water due to the drought um, and retiming and, and working so that we were following all the guidelines and kept all of our grass from dying. Um, that's the last slide, so I'm available for any questions. Great. Thank you, Julian. Uh, any questions for our public works director? I have a short one about repaving Piper Park parking lot. I know when we did the count the city lot on Ward, there was a plan. Alvin, I think, did the plan, and we got a few more parking places. It, is there going to be a plan to sort of look at how to reconfigure that parking for more efficient parking spots? 
Um, we can when we look at it because it'll be a complete rebuild. So everything will be coming out and going back in. So uh, we can look at that. Um, I, I'm not sure there there is, but um, you know, one of the basically um, the old one downtown was angle parking and right. it was converted to uh, straight, rec- yeah, straight parking because it, it yielded a few more spots. So Piper already is that uh, layout, which typically is the most uh, economical way to lay out a parking lot, but uh, we can certainly um, have a look. It may just mean like moving the sand lot, the sand, the sandbag lot to um, the sandbag spaces to a different part of the park or something for a few more spots. Just wondering, because it sometimes it looks like it could use a few more parking spots. Yeah. Councilmember Harris. Yeah, thanks for that great presentation. It's always good to hear it every year. Um, I just had one question on slide 19, uh, which has to do with um, this building. Oh, it's engineering goals for City Hall and for the new library. Mm-hmm. And the question, oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, um, Oh yeah, this is in the CFP. You know, you don't need to go to the slide. I can oh. just ask a question. And the question was just simply, what do you have in mind this coming year for this building? So the the first step is to hire a consultant team that consists of a historical architect and a structural engineer and hand in hand have them look at the building, look at the rules, um, look at the codes um, and figure out what we can, what is feasible to do with this building. It's not, the first step is not who's going to be in the building or how is it going to be uh, arranged as far as uses. It's physically, what are the constraints on renovating this building? The, does the, the facade needs to stay. I think we've all kind of thought that, but what about the rest of the building? Do the windows need to stay where they are? So we'll have a historical architect who will give us that context. And then a structural who will look at the different parts of the building and determine whether it's feasible to rebuild or renovate and what all those options could be. And then take that input and put some dollar figures to, you know, we've given you numbers before that have been ballpark square footage numbers based on other projects. And so the hope is with this team to come in and have a, a more in-depth look at this specifically at this building, we'll be able to generate cost estimates and give you a better idea of what it would cost to renovate or rebuild this building. Um, so we'll have some better numbers to work with before we have the conversation of what do we want this building to, to function as uh, moving forward. Preliminarily, just kind of figuring out what the scope and character of what well, what's possible, really? Yeah, it's to inform the conversation later. It's it's good to know: are, are we looking at six million? Are we looking at twelve? Are we looking at twenty? Because those are, you know, there's different. There's definitely those are different scale projects. Thank you. Other questions? Um, on the Piper Park uh, and the dog park, rather benches or eight benches, um, are any of those being donated or? Plaque, I guess would be. Yeah, they they are not. Um, we actually get a lot of requests for um, for bench donations, and we have them at several areas, and some areas in Piper Park and on a lot of the trails. But this project was all funded by the bridge grant, so the benches were already eighty nine percent paid for by the federal government. So there was not any opportunity to have donations. The donations have gone to other locations. Is there any way we can we can sell plaques on the benches after installation? So we have a bridge a bridge. We have a bench donation program that Rita Shock yeah. in our department runs. And so she basically has a list of areas where we need benches. And so the first thing we need to do is is finish the project and take it over from the contractor. And then we can do an evaluation based on the use of the dog park is do we need more benches in the dog park? And then Rita will make that evaluation and they'll get added to the donation list if that's her determination. Yeah. Well, so we can sell plaques on those benches? Not, 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 not the those. existing, not the existing benches. They would be new benches. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we can't put a plaque on a thing, thanks to Joe Biden, but <laughs> that that's not, not the way. spot yeah, or the, whatever his dog major was it? That got yeah. banned from the White House. Yeah. 
So yeah. the way our program goes now, the people who um, get a plaque on a bench have paid for that bench. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I just, I noticed a lot of communities are selling their benches and it's, it's fascinating to see the ones that are named after dogs. I hope <laughs> given some of the names, you never know, but okay. Just curious. Thank you. Um, there's this, just, just Kevin to that. There's a sweet one that's now in Niven Park where it, I don't forget who it's dedicated to, but who's, it, it says something about who never saw a dog he didn't like because he liked to sit there and watch the dogs. His daughter was at the Niven Park um, ribbon cutting or or project, and he lived right there, and so he admired the dogs too. Uh, Julian, just a couple um, pretty minor questions. One is the um, the service tickets that you get on the website. About how many of those do you get in a year? And I'm curious, sort of the categorization. You know what categories they fall into. Yeah, so we have a number of ways that we get service requests. We There is a widget on the website that pushes a, an email uh, to us. We also do get direct inquiries to our email or phone number or individually to our employees. So it's roughly about 300 in total inquiries mm -hmm. that come in a year. And I would say just under 100 of those come in from the, from the widget. Um, and some of them are... Um, you know, please go mow the lawn or please paint this curb or things that are pretty routine. Um, and then some of them are, you know, I would like to inquire about a, a stop sign relocation or something that requires a little bit more um, follow up. But, um, you know, most of, most of them are, are fairly routine and we're able to respond to their notification. Somebody telling us there's a tree down or something like that. But roughly overall, it, it's averaged around 300 a year. Okay. And just, uh, you know, I, I'm working in customer service a lot. Do you guys kind of keep a metric like, you know, time to resolution, like how long it takes to close a ticket? Um, not really. Um, we can, can, can I jump yeah. in? That's not our metric. Our metric is time to acknowledge. Time to resolve is determined by the need and the, and the prioritization and the other programs we have in place, right? If we did time of resolution and people expected us to to address everything that may or may not be, it may be a priority 25 on our list. Mm -hmm. that, that would be a problem. We'd, we'd become in operationally handicapped, but we do have a metric of time to respond. Okay, fair enough. Um, and uh, one other question on the, um, the Greenway. So are there, and I'm assuming most of the items that you covered have capital improvement plan numbers for them, right? So, so we'll, we'll see them again. Um, is, is there other bike path um, work going on or is that really the main initiative right now? Um, as far as what's approved in our capital program, that's the, the, the major one is the next phase of the North South Greenway. And then um, kind of next up in the planning process would be if there's more improvements to be made on the remainder of old Redwood Highway. Uh, we just this past summer completed, I didn't highlight it when I showed it, but when we did uh, Magnolia Avenue, we, we restriped uh, quite a bit of new class two mm. uh, bike path. And then when we uh, repaved Doherty, we put buffered bike lanes in where there were only regular bike lanes before, and then we added the bike uh, path. So we've just done uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, bike lane and bike path work and really taken a chunk out of what was in our bike uh, and ped master plan. Um, a lot of the remaining projects on there are not um, easy ones to accomplish because they require removal of parking or they require property acquisition. Um, so we don't really have any others that are on the horizon. We do have a minor capital project that gets some seed money every year that's for minor improvements. If we get a request for an ADA ramp somewhere or minor tweaking or fixing or moving a fence away from a bike path or something small of that nature. Uh, but as far as significant uh, bike improvements, your the old Redwood Highway is really the only one that's on the, the radar CIP wise. Okay, great. Thank you. That's all I have. Thanks again, Julie, Thank for, for all the hard work and long list of accomplishments. Just one more comment on the, the bike greenway path. I met with Julian the other day and... Uh, uh, thank you very much for going over all the, of it in detail. And I have got a lot of information out of it. I want to thank you for the time. Thank you.
Help us getting ready to get any hands raised. And oh, yeah. So as Julian left, I was going to make one quick comment. He didn't have this on his challenges, but it amuses me, and I think probably amuses Kathy Orm. Uh, I don't think I've ever in my career had to tell the public works director to start spending money, but we have all these wonderful pots of money that he's helped us build up, but we're having trouble getting contractors right now. Wow. Mm. So things like the American Rescue Plan money, we need to spend it, and we're just struggling to get all that work commissioned. So that's a challenge for the next year. So that's a good challenge. Uh, that leaves Elise Simonian to come up, who the you know, council may recall was very new when she joined us last year during this exercise. Um, and uh, I, I warned her she was inheriting a department that everyone had retired and was decimated. So just had to rebuild the department this year. Thank you. Yeah, so the past, um, we're, we do these statistics on it calendar year just because we haven't finished the fiscal year yet but the building department issued 801 building permits and that included 54 new housing units which uh, 44 of which were for the home key project on south alicio and 115 resale reports were issued 28 planning applications and 27 heritage tree removal permits and over half of those were for free permits that we issue for dangerous or uh, hazardous trees and the city council had or considered two appeals. The planning commission approved a number of applications as well as the zoning administrator. And uh, the most significant project this past year has been the 20 unit Magnolia Village project. And the code enforcement closed 43 cases, which was a significant increase over 2021. And that was primarily due to uh, having more contract staff hours for a contract code enforcement person to follow up with their cases. Even though the building permit numbers were down, the valuation was up over 14 million um, over the prior year. And some the and that was due to a couple of significant commercial projects, one being, which I guess somewhat residential, the home key project on South Lisio, as well as um, a remodel of the Tamil Pius assisted living and memory care facility. Mm -hmm. And accomplishments for the community development department last year was filling both the senior planner and the associate planner positions. Um, we have Jackie O'Neill and Alex Othon. And Alex, um, we celebrated him today because he's graduating from uh, with a master's in public administration from USF on Saturday. Oh, good. And the, the biggest uh, accomplishment of this past year has been launching our online permitting software, which has been just a tremendous uh, help to staff to have the, the system that helps us transmit permits between departments really efficiently, and also to track applications and fees. And uh, we submitted an application for a pro housing designation that it's still being worked on um, to try to get enough points to be in that, in that program. And then um, have scheduled a number of housing element programs um, that will be coming to you eventually, including a commercial linkage fee and updates to our inclusionary housing fees and policy, and then a number of ordinances to comply with state laws, like new ADU laws, parking, floor ratio regulations, um, and other 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 laws that we that we just need to update in order to comply with the state passing new legislation. And then. Um, Actions I'd like to attribute to the council since their ordinance you, you adopted, um, there was a COVID-19 emergency ordinance. This actually took place in June at the end of the last fiscal year. And then uh, you adopted a permanent ordinance to implement SB9 with the, the two unit projects in single family residential neighborhoods. You adopted new building standards and the new tall gate regulations and increased fines for violation of short-term rental ordinance. And we haven't received any complaints about short-term rentals anytime recently. So it's been a, a great year for that. For goals for this coming year is completing the general plan and, and adopting the environmental impact report, as well as the update to the housing element. And then there'll be a number of ordinances that will be coming your way in order to implement programs in the housing element. And then adopting the objective design and development standards, we do have a deadline for that, as well as just wanting to have these standards in place for any future developments that might come in. 
and then a need to we need to adopt a vehicle mile traveled policy to address Senate Bill 743. We're also planning to implement um, a number of well, that's another program in the housing element that just things that we're required to do again under state law, and then um, we have an add out for an in house building official, and we've been receiving some responses to that. So I'm hoping that that position will be filled hopefully within the next few months would be my goal. And that concludes my update. Wow. Thank you, Elise. Uh, questions for our community development director? I have a quick one, Elisa. We we worked a lot on the housing element. Um, you mentioned that some ordinances might be coming. I know this isn't really part of the main, you know, presentation, but if you could just speak at a very general level, like what what those would be. Well, the main ordinance that hopefully will be coming with the housing element is the overlay that would allow buy right development for the housing and housing overlay sites or the the ones that are identified in the inventory, um, and then. Uh, some of the other ordinances might, or some of the other issues might be taken care of with some of the ordinances that I'm bringing forward now um, in hopes of just not having a program in the housing element for some of them, um, like the update to the accessory dwelling unit ordinance. Um, so, but there, I think there'll be other, there'll be other programs like um, actions that you'll see in the, in the housing element in terms of affirmatively furthering fair housing um, other programs we need to do. So maybe not ordinances, but um, but other either outreach or news <laughs> um, There's just a variety of programs in the housing element. Okay, and uh, one other is the e-track it. So that's in place and you you had the number of you know permits that have gone through. How how many of those, what percent has gone through the new system and any you know sense of how much you know, customer feedback, like, you know, this has saved me a lot of time or, you know, sort of what, what uh, the reception has been. So we're, we still, it's still been a bumpy road implementing the, the program. Most permits, I believe there's still, all the permits are coming in electronically, either by email or through eTrackit. I think most permits are probably being applied for on eTrackit, but um, we're still getting some plans from email as we get people used to using the system. And um, so we've had complaints because there's been issues with the soft, I don't know if you call it software, but the program itself, there's been issues with contractors registering, which has been a frustration to both staff and the contractors. Um, is, and just as soon as we work something out, it seems like some other program or problem comes up. So um, I'd, I haven't received a lot of complaints, but we just know there's been frustration with some people that have been trying to use it and it's not working as it's supposed to be working. So, so it's a it's a software as a service, and they need to customize it for the city of Larkspur. I, I know we've yeah. had some presentation a while ago, but I'm forgetting it the was details. Customized for Larkspur, and then it also integrates with this California State License Board. So there's there's a registration that a public user can register for, like any homeowner could go and apply for a permit, and then there's a contractor registration that's tied in with the state licensing board, and so it's it's checking if the person's licensed, mm. and in that in that part of the program. Um, every apparently every time the state licensing board changes something with their database, our database doesn't work. So, um, and people have to get new passwords. And there's been little just hiccups in terms of that part of the program. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Uh, and I guess I should ask in the public if there are any questions. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks, Elise. But just to add to our staff just loves it. And it's so it's mm. been just so much easier to transmit permits. So the staff is really, really happy with the way it's working, even though there's been like even with the frustrations of some of the problems. Great. Thank you. Uh, before we move on, I mentioned that I share the responsibility for the administration department with Kathy Orm, the administrative services director. And there are a few things I wanted to highlight that aren't as much about finance and, uh, and some of our operational costs. One is I really want to acknowledge the work that our city clerk is in the administrative department's done, particularly with getting our hybrid meeting system, not only up and running, but smooth uh, public participation is going swimmingly in terms of uh, the hybrid environment. And uh, personally, I still think it's a real shame we're not allowed to 
for you when you have need to participate remotely without jumping through a rather insane number of hoops. So, um, but if and when the legislature gets more enlightened in my opinion, then perhaps you'll be able to do that again. Um, <laughs> the other thing is, uh, one of the things I've felt a, a lot of pride for our whole team um, and uh, is, is about the grant for the library. Not just because we got it, but I can't tell you now how many Marin agencies have told me how much they regret they didn't apply. And for those who don't know, there's another round of funding available now. Uh, first round recipients can't try to get more, but um, th there are several Marin agencies contemplating submitting because now they've seen the roadmap that we were able to build um, and that, oh, there is a path to getting this money that I think probably wasn't as apparent to some of the other agencies um, when they just saw it for first blush. So uh, I think that was really a major accomplishment. And then lastly, you've had some presentations lately about sustainability and the work we're doing. Um, I think I really wanna acknowledge Shannon O'Hare's work to help centralize that in my office. And so I think, um, we're now coordinating our sustainability efforts in a way that's comparable to the other communities. Uh, we just don't have that sustainability coordinator label flashing on anybody's title, but I think we're doing a great job now. And I think you saw that in some of the work plan efforts that we're starting to bring forward. So just a few things I wanna highlight from the admin unit. Um, and if the council's ready, we can dive into the meat of the evening, which is, is the, the budget and the CIP will start with the budget. At this meeting, we tend to emphasize the, the general fund. I'm gonna ask Kathy to come up while I'm starting to talk because she's gonna save me when I make mistakes. Um, I did make one mistake when I submitted the materials to the city clerk for this agenda item. I didn't attach a report called the budget comparison report, which is a really valuable tool to uh, look at this budget in the context of several of the previous years. So that's now been added to the material so that you have it uh, in front of you. Um, and I apologize for that oversight um, and want to make sure everybody knows it was me, not Kathy. Well, <laughs> I got the agenda and I was like, what's this? What am I looking at? It yeah. was my worksheet to build the budget brief. So um, I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> So with that, uh, I am going to just hit on some high level topics for you, and then we'll um, start diving into the numbers in whichever way the council wants to take us. So I'm really pleased to say this budget is balanced. Uh, I mentioned that uh, as a preview at your last meeting. Um, emphasize that sales tax is flattening, and that's a trend we expect for the next few years. So we have to start planning around the fact that we may not see the growth we've been enjoying in that revenue stream. Um, but property tax just keeps going. Um, it's remained strong and we are basically a property tax based um, agency. And then I misspoke at the last meeting, I'd said TOT looked flat. We look back and Kathy showed me in the numbers that we're actually expect, experiencing growth there. We're still not back to pre-pandemic levels, but we're getting awfully close. So uh, that's an exciting statement about what's happening out at the courtyard by Marriott. Um, so we've programmed an increase into the TOT. Here's a summary of what was adopted last year and what we're projecting in the budget um, so that you can get a sense of what's going on. Uh, the sales tax, as we said, it's essentially flat, even though you see a small uh, a delta in there. The other thing is with the building permits, which is another key revenue stream for us, we're showing a $100,000 reduction. That's not reflective of a change really in activity. It's that if you go two fiscal years back, we were using a different methodology for how we were accounting for building permits. And when we were adjusting for the new methodology, we were uh, last year, we had to do a little guesswork and probably were a little higher than we should have been. So 800,000 is a better number for the way the, the new methodology works. Some challenges that are reflected in this budget, the cost of doing business is going up, just going up across the whole economy. 
Um, I've mentioned that we have looming labor negotiations. So we're trying to make sure that this budget is prepared for next year's budget. So we had to be thoughtful about that because that those costs will hit in the, in the subsequent fiscal year's budget. And I've mentioned to you, we keep getting hit in our insurance pool, insurance costs really going up. Uh, that's got a lot to do with concerns about wildfire and other uh, natural disasters in California. It also has a lot to do with uh, juries giving sizable awards, particularly in the area of police liability. And so that's trickling through Central Marin Police and hitting us. And then we just are having to do a lot to, to deal with a lot of state regulation. Uh, I think I highlighted Cal Recycles, one that's exponentially ex costing us more, but um, every one of these departments has to come back up here and tell you about different regulations they're now having to deal with and, and the rising costs there. Uh, this budget has a few staffing changes. It's relatively the same as the year before, though, but um, in total, we have 34 and a half FTE programmed. And that half, as I mentioned to you, you've authorized us to have overlap of two administrative services directors so that they could work in concert and during a transition period. Um, so um, at mid year, um, when Kathy retires, we'll actually be down at. 34 for the balance of the fiscal year. Um, we have a position that's funded in the library that we don't have filled at this time. When we have a new director, that director needs to give some thought to what that position should be, both in terms of what we need today and what we need as we transition to the new facility in a few years. Um, we're also looking at, you heard Nick Stone talking about bringing programming back into recreation. That takes a level of labor and um, commitment and, and job skill that uh, is better suited to a title of recreation coordinator. That's a, in our industry, a term that's common. And so we're looking to um, replace a currently funded position of community services assistant with a recreation coordinator. The incumbent is, has been being trained to transition. So this isn't costing anybody their position. He's being trained to be promoted into that position. And then lastly, you heard uh, Julian Skinner mention, um, we now feel comfortable taking the senior engineer position, which we had originally hired on a four-year contract and making it a permanent position. This position, um, in general, with all of engineering, we try to do a lot of cost recovery out of projects. So the projects are paying for money into the general fund to cover the, the compensation for the positions in engineering as much as possible. This one in particular, um, Julian and his team know to try to make as much, if not all of the senior engineer recovered by charging the cost against the projects. Um, and that's an, most grant funding, which a lot of our projects have some element of grant funding, allow for some of that administrative recovery. And that's all I had to give you a quick high level uh, view on the budget. And uh, as you mentioned, you have number, you have uh, in the packet, you have some previews of some of the pretty graphs and pie charts that Kathy uh, does for us uh, that break down the, the way we're spending money, the way we're collecting money. Um, and then you have a breakdown of how of the worksheet that she used to prepare those um, graphics. And then now you have the budget comparison report. We're happy to go anywhere you want with these numbers. If we're a little confused, we'll tap one of the department heads to give us the specifics about their operations. That, Mr. Mayor, I turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you. So I I think it would be good to maybe just just to run through some of the numbers. I you know you've put them all together. We've read the report. Um, I just had two minor questions, uh, um, Dan. Uh, uh, one was um, the thirty-four and a half FTEs is the balanced budget assuming they're fully staffed you know we have a library director we have the engineer we have the assistant we've changed the park title is is that is that where the yeah, so the load is when we say an ft we've programmed the funding for that position into the budget okay so okay. Okay. we don't we don't list a position unless we're asking you to fund it understood um and then just uh taking a step back to the tot can you remind me what the pre-covid level was we're at about 600 to we 800 had cleared a million i think the last year before the pandemic okay uh 
for several years right before the pandemic we were in the 900,000 okay. area um okay. you know, i had been told at the time by the general manager that 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 that, that was the uh, second highest occupancy rate of any courtyard in the system um and the courtyard one of the marketing changes that's really driven the tot up as i recall was that uh, Marriott agreed to treat it as a San Francisco property, which changed its entire branding. So, okay. And and one last um, question. I know this comes up a lot. So we see our property tax revenue going up, and that's primarily a turnover where people are reassessed. You know, the the Prop 13, uh, you know, tax that that's being charged is then then bumped up to the market rate. Is that where most of the increase is coming from? I don't have a breakdown. That is in a significant portion of it. So somebody has held a property for a significant number of years. So they're at one assessed value and then you carry the new assessed value. Um, but I mentioned briefly last meeting when I highlighted this trend, um, when people remodel in Larkspur, a lot of those remodels are fairly substantial and that results in an added assessed value to the property. And so that adds to our, our assessed value across Larkspur as well. Great, thank you. Uh, any other council members want to before we dive into some of the details? You know, questions? Yeah. So yeah, Kathy, if you want to just guide us through uh, some of the highlights, that would be wonderful. Okay. Well, we talked. We've talked about property tax, sales tax, and other taxes um, would be where the TOT is and um, business license. And our transfer tax that we get on the sales of property tax, which is not, you know, it's just small. And then our franchise fees that consist of the cable company, garbage company, and um, PG&E um, that give us franchise fees. Um, I, I, I'm not sure what everybody's looking at. It might be easier if I... Okay, this. okay perfect. Is that what we're, yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah, the budget comparison okay. report. So this is, this is building the main tax basis from yeah. that. And um, as you can see where the, you know, the TOT has gone. And then we go into license and permitting. So you can see how it has um, grown over the years. So if it has been busy and um, going into the penalties and fines with the vehicle fines that we get from the state. Um, is pretty flat, so it's seemingly pretty even. Can I can yeah. I ask just someone about this? And I, I don't think I read the article too clearly, but there was something recently about the franchise AT and T or some of the cables getting some of their franchise fees returned to them. Or did I read that right? Mm -hmm. did, was it just something yeah. recently? I don't know if that's yeah, that was in Sunday's us. paper. I think yeah. But you're ahead of us. Okay. Mm -hmm. It was in Sunday's paper, I think. I think so. It may be applying so. just to the county, but it was, it, oh. Oh, it was county property. only? Okay. Uh, I hear Jillian Skinner saying it was property, property tax. tax. Franchise feed, property, franchise yeah, fees. Property. Hmm. Okay. I'll look that up because it was something with franchise fees. You read it too, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I did too. Sorry to interrupt you there. I yeah. just saw that in your list here. Looking it up to go read it myself. I didn't see that. Um, anything else on the taxes then as I'm kind of going through um, our main tax revenue and then um, I, I had gone through the building fees and I think that Dan had talked and Elisa talked about the building fees and the permits that have come in like substantial remodels or part of our building permit fees. Um, the vehicle fines come from the state. Those are like vehicle pieces that come through the state. Um, investment earnings, I'm very conservative on the investment earnings and I'm not sure you know, how well they're gonna perform or not. Right now they're doing well, it could take a, a dip at any time. So I'm very careful there. You can see where we got COVID relief money coming in <clears throat> in 2021, and then we have nothing there for the rest of the time, but that was a help back in 2021. Um, we go into fees for services, which is 
a lot more of our other fees that we have for our other departments um, with the permitting and planning. Um, we also have the engineering fees that are coming in. This is also new that we are beginning to see a lot more engineering fees start up. Um, we also have collecting for um, our trench fees. This is where our brand new paved streets, if PG&E or other utilities come in after we've just paved them, and we get to collect um, to be able to repave and bring them back to their pristine state they are in now. Um, we also have recreation. Um, we'll see start seeing recreation probably coming back with the more rentals for the parks as we start to really get back into swing of uh, of normal life back again with in person. Um, On to I don't know if there's any questions in the permitting the other the services line items. Um, other revenue is kind of a hit and miss. It's just a lot of oddball revenues that come in at times that I, there's not a whole lot to talk about or discuss there. Um, and then the transfers, there is definitely, we always, um, this is the transfers coming in, we get gas tax money that we transfer in to cover for some of the uh, maintenance and engineering in our gas tax reports. And then we can go into our expenses, which is um, one of the big pieces of the expenses that um, should be highlighted is that uh, we do not have any unfunded liability in PERS. PERS did very well last year, so we have zero unfunded liability owed for this next year. So that's huge. I've left the line item in there for us to look at. Um, we also have a line item of uh, Citywide contract services, which would be services that are used throughout the city and not in one department or another. And that's relatively flat. Um, city Council, we've give <clears throat> we've added a little extra money for your um, travel and lodging budget. So we have we can go out to more conferences. <laughs> I'm gonna go in September. Um, the admin budget uh, has grown, and that's mainly due to the 0.5 FTE for the admin services um, overlap on that budget. Um, I don't, Danny, I don't know if you have anything else on the admin side to say. Um, the building maintenance is, is this city hall building. Um, we have added a lot of the IT services in here. We have IT services that work for, for each department for laptops. We do a per laptop per part department split, but um, we've done a lot of work on the network. I know Dan's talked about the networking and we may need some more equipment for our networking services or our ITs. And this is built into this budget as long as the maintenance in the city hall that we have here. We also have, uh, centralized our purchasing for office supplies. Anything that needs to run this building for overhead gets bought into this budget. Uh, Kathy, quick question on the IT services, the 137,000, is that, are those recurring or are those fixed? The costs, sorry. yeah. Oh, those are, um, those are our three vendors of our IT services for um, they are monthly reoccurring, yes. Recurring, okay. And then I noticed the general liability insurance, you know, Dan had mentioned yeah. earlier that increase is, you know, and I've heard that 20 to 30% yeah. all over. So that that's going to be generally for all our insurances. We'll see some kind of hike like that. Uh, yeah, well, this is where we have our, like the like I said, the general liability and the property um, insurance and then um, the workers' comp was the other piece of Bay Cities that went up, is, and that's by department. So the departments had to absorb that as well as any personnel increase in cost. The personnel increase in cost, you know, we have a 4% COLA um, that has, is coming in July that's part of our budget as well. For, um, 
going down to the planning and building. So um, uh, we've met with the lease and we've talked about, she has a position for a building official that's been budgeted in salaries and budgets. She also is, has a contract person to, that she has working now in building official capacity. So that is, um, the building official is part of her budget. And as she was saying, she's hoping to find somebody to get them on track in the next couple months, which is exciting because that position has been open for a while. Um, fire budget was uh, adopted, as Dan said, the last fire um, council member last week, along with the police services. Um, they tried, you know, we're trying relatively to keep them under control as they do the police budget as well. So. <clears throat> Why does it say Corte Madera Fire Department? Is I know. I'm sorry. This oh. is a, <laughs> this was a, um, an, old, an old holdover oh, from me. Got it. It needs to be changed. I can. I'll, that will be changed before the budget is brought back. No um, but this is our Larkspur's contributions to the our Central the Marine. Central Marine Fire Department, and so I will. And I'll also have renamed fire as Central Marine Fire, and I will rename police as Central Marine Police. Authority, so it can be properly addressed. I know it was brought to my attention recently, and I was like, "Oh, I look at it all the time, and I don't see it." Um, the disaster preparedness. Um, this is the charges. Was a inter. Yeah, we were saying you were saying. I asked Kathy to add the term interagency in front of this. This is not. Larkspur's Cooperative Disaster Preparedness with Corte Madera. This is the countywide program, which has sputtered and started, sputtered and started, sputtered and started. It's starting again. We haven't gotten a bill yet for what Larkspur's contribution to it will be, but it's actually been now a couple of years since they had somebody before. That's what that line is for. It's basically, and whatever other costs all the fire chiefs propose, because for those who are aware, the interagency countywide program is kind of being run through the fire chiefs association, um, but it's distinct from the Twin Cities operations, which are housed in the fire budget for the fire authority. Right. Any questions so far on any other one? So the, and, uh, um, building inspections is pretty much the same as uh, it's running as um, as normal, except for let's see if I have to put glasses on to see. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> ah, that's right. There was there's an increase in sorry, at least was it the code enforcement? So code, we're adding for code, code enforcement in the... Yeah, just um, council, we've mentioned before, um, the demand for us to address code enforcement issues that relate to private property has exploded. So part of it, I think, was the pandemic and people being home and just sort of staring at things they didn't like. Um, but... Um, We've had to, we, we've been outsourcing that. We have actually a good resource right now. Someone who's really been very effective for us, but um, that's what that line's for to pay for that service. Okay. Um, I also, there's a miscellaneous plan check fees in here that was, um, that is new to taking um, any of the invoices that were being cut were being applied against the deposits are now being brought. We're recognizing expenses when we should and revenues when we should. So this is that's all part of that. It shouldn't say plan check because that's not really what that is. That needs to be changed as well. Um, engineering, most of engineering is um, the salary and benefits as most places. Um, there is a small, Building and structural maintenance increase. Julian, do you want to add to anything to that one? Um, 
there is a good mention with um, the streets budget with the LED lights, the street savings, there's recognizing utilities. I asked Jillian about this. I said, are you kidding me? You, you're cutting your utilities? <laughs> and that is from the LED lights. So that's a great cost savings there that's where we're beginning to see immediately. Anything else? Um, any Quick, quick question on um, the office rent, um, the $48,000. Yes. Is that related to the space we're using from Tamil Pius Union or? It's yes. The core pride okay. Lease. So, and that's an that's a annual fee. We pay them yes. 48000 or For the first several years of the lease, we were owed credit because mm -hmm. we made, when we did our own tenant improvements, we offered to do improvements that benefited the district because it captured economies of scale. And so we agreed on what the value of those investments were for the district. And we were basically checking down 48,000 a year against that, that credit expired. So that's why you're now seeing it as a payment. For the, the first budget. time. Um, was it, this year's the first full year, I think. Yeah, so, okay. and so it's 4,000 a month. Okay, great, thank you. Um, on that, I'll tell you, I, in one of the reports I highlighted, I had a question, was the loan that was taken out to make those improvements, uh, how much longer is that loan? Our period loan goes, I believe, until 2037. That's a long term. Yeah, it's, I, I'll get back. I, I was I'll just hoping it was going to drop out if it's near future, but. I said it just sort of flagged in my mind. So it's a long term. I want to get back to you. I, I think it might be shorter than that, but we'll check. I can pull it up. I'll pull it up when we get through this. And um, streets. Uh, and sorry, one, one really minor one is the um, equipment replacement. We were talking about the electric leaf blowers. Is that the 5,723 is for? that equipment which so line are you which, uh it's it's uh in which just budget? just above streets two lines above streets equipment replacements on on page uh for engineering yeah for, for engineering page seven sorry uh, i don't think that's where your leaf blowers went no the leaf blowers were funded with one time money in a bid budget um last year um so that's just a uh, regular um equipment there's a line for that in both streets and parks so you have Equipment for hatching potholes and, for example, parks and mowers and and blowers. That's uh, um, that's just the routine of all the equipment we have. A number that gets tied for what are expected turnover and equipment that year. The, the conversion to the electric leaf blowers was a, a big number that was from standalone one time budget um, last year. Okay, and, and sorry, one more question going back the uh, LED lights. So I wasn't aware that the city actually pays PG&E or whomever for public lighting. So, so the fact that we've gone to a lower, uh, you know, wattage is is really that's like again in seven years that'll pay off the or six years the the in the investment and then that'll be a permanent savings as long as those lights run. Yes. Okay. And is there other public utilities we're paying for? I, I, I wasn't really clear, like basically everything on Magnolia most, and Doherty we most, pay for. Most utilities charge us. So okay. <laughs> one of the biggest expenses is water. We pay a lot for water, just like everybody else. Yeah. We're we're trembling too, the, the <laughs> announcement that just came down because it'll affect us. Unfortunately, I'll get, I'll get on my high horse for a sense for all the great things we've done in Marin. We are behind a lot of parts of the state in delivering reclaimed or recycled water for watering things like lawns and parks. So we water with mm -hmm. potable water and because we don't have a choice and um, we're gonna be paying some serious amounts to, to keep watering lawns. So we're gonna have to make some tough decisions mm -hmm. about, about the conditions of our parks going forward. So in this budget, we're gonna run it like last year, we'll be using the tap water to water all the 11 parks. We don't have a choice. No, we only have that resource is to rent water. Um, 
I think the question as we can assume we'll eventually be back in drought is that um, we'll be put on ration appropriately and we'll have to make some decisions about what's the level and quality of landscaping in the parks in light of what water will have available and what water costs. Thanks. On the, the note, um, or I think I mentioned this in the past, is, is there any way to determine whether we have spring water? And I mean, there was water before municipal water district. There were wells, I assume, in the city. And, um, you know, this is dating back a few years. Have, have we ever done a survey of are there any uh, wells or you know, water that could be used from springs to water our parks or you know, I, storm I don't, water. I don't know that if that's been, it certainly has not been studied in my time being here. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm i now, can't barely recall the part of my career that wasn't Larkspur, that's how much I think about Larkspur, but uh, I did at one time work for a city that had a mix of water sources, including groundwater and it's actually pretty complicated under all the regulations to to draft groundwater for municipal purposes. Well, one of the things we're facing is having to clean up our stormwater, but that's of course water that comes when we don't need it to water, you know. But is there a way to to capture it or to store it to for when it, we hit the next drought? I don't know that we have ever commissioned a study about what those volumes are, and I'm, I'm not sure that we have in a position to answer that. I, I just it, why it strikes me is because I know um, when Sausalito was doing the new Dumphy Park, their city engineer uh, realized not too far away was Water Street and, it tur and Spring Street, and it turned out there's a spring, and they're trying to figure out a way to get water from one of the old springs down to water the park with and it just occurred to me well that's pretty clever and i'm i wonder if we have the same well i'll go way i don't want to take us too far in the weeds i'll just close with way back in my career i got involved in groundwater battles and it's dangerous to casually say you're going to start tapping springs mm -hmm. because you don't necessarily know what the downstream consequence of doing that is that's why i'm saying pumping groundwater is is not a simple little task. Okay. Just just a footnote on the groundwater issue. There is groundwater around here. It's spotty, but I know that for a fact because their their neighbor across the street has a has an operating well um, that they've had forever. Well, I I mean we know there's springs running under the downtown, so there's some of these businesses that can lift up trap doors and show you the springs if you want to go see them. So they, I know they exist, but whether or not you should be tapping them for municipal purposes, I don't know. Uh, I'll leave that to Mr. Skinner to propose a study. It makes a big difference if it's a spring or if it's really groundwater, because if it's a spring, it's surface water, and uh, that's treated differently. There's something for your free time, Julian, you know. Okay. Well, talking about parks, you can see that the water increase does exist. Um, it hit for 22.9 um, in that budget. There's some other inflationary costs going up as well for contract services and building and structures. Um, moving on to recreation. Recreation is... Um, kind of business as usual, taking most of it in the salary and benefit hits with the in COLA increases. And that brings us down to library, uh, child care center. This is there where we pay for their um, retiree medical. And I had made a guess at it at the last year and I can, um, it was new. So we've now, we're paying, you know, it will, closer to what it is, so we have decreased that. Um, and then in the library, library is also pretty, most of um, the library savings, they've got a little bit in the salaries. Um, I believe their overtime budget is the same. And um, there's no, any other increase, you know, big increases in their budget, it's kind of flat for the moment. Um, 
We also have the Heritage Borge, which we, and the rent is a uh, lockbox at the bank and um, whatever contract services they have in there. Um, our debt services, uh, you can see where we have the merit bond payment and then the courtyard loan payment is the 242 um, is what it is for those improvements for that loan that we took out and I'll look up when it expires. Um, on to the transfer outs. Um, the 1.2 would be for our debt services on the, the pension bonds that the general fund is paying, which is actually less than what we'd be paying PERS. And um, I think we, when we went through that whole exercise, we would be saving. Um, could, Kevin, you've got a question? No, I just, I just, I was just curious. Uh, other than that, it is a very unique. Um, um, form of debt that the city has relative to the other ones. Is that the reason you singled it out for separate treatment in these? Yes. That's what I mean. Yes. So we have considerable savings for the debt service versus what we'd be paying PERS and our liability, unfunded liabilities that was raising astronomically on that. Um, we transfer to cover our insurance fund, and we cover. We also make uh, transfer to capital by a hundred hundred thousand. I usually put that in for any general fund monies that need to cover some some project that comes up that doesn't always get transferred. But some, you know, I would put it in for safekeeping in case we need money to be transferred over to capital. So that brings our budget actually to balance this year. So. Um, I'm not Yay. sure if there was other <laughs> questions. I'm sorry, it was a little dry. <laughs> it's hard to go through the line items in an exciting manner. Some of us like numbers, so it's fine. <laughs> no, no, I, I really appreciate. I mean, even some of the you know comments about the water bill. I mean, these are things we, you know, they they come up and they you know at least they're registered. Um, any questions from the council? The most common question I get from um, constituents is um, where we're parking our money and how safe are we? And I'm assuming based on everything else I've seen about you and heard about you, we're in safe places as far as that goes, but it does make people nervous. You know. I Understandably, um, we bank with Bank of Marin, and I was just telling Dan today, I, you know, I truly am so pleased that we have a bank that I can walk in and talk to the manager. And we had a change in bank managers and the old bank manager came to see me before she left because we have a relationship. They see us in there and they're happy to have us and they work with us. And it's great to have, be known by name. It's great to be known when I go in and they bend over backwards for us. Um, I meant to say with one of the goals, um, working with the bank, um, as I had been also working with an investment firm called Time Value Investments um, to, to invest some money with a laddering or investments. And we also have money in LAIF and Caltrust and they saw money go out and they contacted me and said, hey, what can we do for you? So now our money market fund is now earning 3.5%. So um, our, we have a majority of our money in Bank of Marin, but we do have money in LAIF and we do have money in Caltrust, which is very similar to LAIF in interest rates. And then we also have, we bought on short term some CDs um, that they're, it's all an in investment report. They're making pretty good returns right now. So, so LAIF for the non-initiated is the local agency oh, investment sorry. fund. Uh, it's very popular with local government because um, you can make transfers in and out of, it's a statewide fund uh, with modest, sometimes low interest rates, but the attraction is liquidity. You can get your money whenever you really need it to put it to work. So most local agencies put some portion of their treasury in life. Um, Caltrust is also a statewide option and that's a little bit more of an investment situation but uh, also very low risk 
Um, this year, Kathy retained the own investment advisor. So that's been exciting. And we're doing a little bit more of laddering in CDs and in, and in uh, money market accounts. Um, but you have, a, uh, in fact, have had people recommend that a future project be to revisit our investment policy. It, uh, it's pretty strict. It's very strict. So um, <laughs> conservative. Um, we are always, I think, we take our cues from you. Our staff's very conservative about money too, but I do think there may be a room for a little bit uh, broader investment strategy than we're using right now. Okay. I heard Bitcoin's a good investment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my grandson stopped so, talking about that. Very <laughs> don't don't take that cue. <laughs> no, just and I would just want to say, I mean, I've been following um, both Sausalitos and Nevada's budget problems and. Uh. Uh, God, I I don't worry about it. I sleep very well at night. Well, I, um, I what you've done, I'm very impressed. It has. Um, I have to thank my fellow department heads because if it wasn't for their support, and you know, they put together the you know I do the salary and budgets, but they did also put together their line items, and then they stick to them. Right, we've all been very conservative in our spending and we all get it. And so we've all been trying to make it work. It's not just, it's, it has been a total group effort, which has been, um, it's been awesome. You know, it's been great to be working with everybody here. And uh, then the council is also being very conservative as well. So it's, you know, all the way around. Well, Kathy was going through all the numbers. I did find the staff report for the loan you asked about for the corp yard. It's a 15 year loan that we took out in 2013. So it ends in 2028. Okay. Oh, okay. Right. It was 10 years off. <laughs> Conservative again. Okay. And, and just one, one other question. I, um, again, I'm just like council member Carol, you know, just pleased that we were in good shape. Um, and I've been, thinking about some of the small areas, like we, we just talked about the water, if there were a option for recycled water, that could be a savings. I think um, the city manager once mentioned that there's, you know, the insurance costs are going up and there may be a way for, you know, uh, a pooling, you know, resource to go on, you know, as a kind of deductible pool or something. Our just big picture, are there any areas in the budget where you see, you know, opportunities for savings now or in the future? You know, I think we run a pretty tight budget. I don't really see where we, any of the departments are, um, have, you know, maybe a little cutting here and there, but nothing that's going to make a big difference. I mean, we're really pretty conservative. And, you know, I do ask the hard questions when they come in. You know, we had, um, you know, I will ask if something looked like, what is going on? I don't always remember, like, <laughs> all the little details, but, um, you know, they always have a justifiable answer. And I don't, I don't worry about anybody inflating their budgets. I, I can't think of an area. I think your staff knows that one of the desires of the council is for us to collaborate as much with our neighboring agencies to, to as possible. Um, and we're doing a lot of that. Um, that doesn't always yield cost savings, mm -hmm. but it expands our services at lower cost. So that, in a sense, translates to a savings because it gets us the service levels the community wants without us bearing the full brunt of that expansion. Sometimes we're able to bring our costs down. It's just I think we've probably done almost every opportunity that's a pure cost savings by combining agencies. I think the last area to explore, and it's just a challenging area, is whether we're now getting to a comfort level where we might be more entrepreneurial and sell services to other agencies. I think um, mm -hmm. we may have a couple of service areas that have some revenue opportunities that we'll try to explore as we go forward. But that, that's a tricky, tricky situation because, um, you know, first and foremost, we need to deliver our service responsibilities to the community before we can offer our people up for, for use by other agencies. Okay, thank you. In, in that, to that extent, when you recruit, I mean, Kathy 
also does the books for CMPA. Um, is the new individual you're recruiting going to be engaged in that similar uh, overlap of activities? So we are and will continue to be the finance department for the Central and Police Authority and the Ross Valley Paramedic Authority unless they decide okay. they want to go with someone else. Okay. But I think Ross Valley Paramedic Authority had that conversation once and realized that we're giving them a sweetheart deal and um, stopped talking about it. So. <laughs> True. It was uh, they were questioning um, if you know we they actually do pay us for our services, so we we do receive money from them. And I they were questioning, and I could justify it, and I said, but you know, go go check, you know, take it back to the county, see what they would charge you for this. <laughs> Get moved. That was it. That was several years ago. So we're. <laughs> All right. Well, Kathy, thank you so much. Thank you. Do you want to see if the public had any? Yeah, I, I tend to forget <laughs> when we have long meetings. Um, uh, Allison, is there anybody in the public? Who... Oh, it's Kevin, he's over here. <laughs> I'm oh, I didn't even see that. Sorry, Kevin. Raise hands from our Zoom audience members. You. There's no public comment. Okay, so bringing it back, it looks like Councilmember Carroll had a question. I thought you did. Oh, um, not really, but uh, there is one thing that going through the line item uh, stuff, there were a couple of places where disaster preparedness was zero, and that worries me. Um, but I was happy to see the increase in the travel and training um, for the employees, and I don't want to prejudice upcoming negotiations in any way, but that's an area... I feel very strongly about um, giving our employees the opportunities um, for advanced level training. And I think particularly, I know we're working on the website and how we communicate with the community at some point. I hope we're gonna focus a little more on that as a topic at one of our meetings. Uh, but that's an area I really think we'd like to see a lot of improvement is on the tech side. I don't particularly love it myself, I don't like Facebook or any of the next door. I don't like reading them, but they are important ways to communicate. I think we could use some improvement there. And that's just the, but in general, I, I'm very supportive of uh, giving our employees the time to go to professional conventions and, and training of any kind that'll help them and help us in the long run. I think it's really an important issue. Yes, I just want to emphasize again, the zero that's in the budget for disaster preparedness, I'm having relabeled because that's very specific to the countywide program. Uh, I would, without pulling Central Marin's budget up, I think we're probably contributing upwards of seven or 50,000 to a million dollars if you count measure C. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't count measure C, we're still probably in the six figures, what we're spending on disaster preparedness. And that's without measure G having joined our portfolio of options. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. And once again, Kathy, thank you so much. Well, we might make her stay at least to hear the next presentation. So if she hears something that's inaccurate, she'll correct it. <laughs> So I'm going to invite Julian Skinner up. Uh, he already gave you a, a top level preview, but uh, this is the meeting where we really dig into the capital improvement program. Um, and of course, a reminder, this is more of a workshop format. We'll have public hearings on these items at your next meeting uh, where we'll ask you to actually approve these documents. Um, but Julian's going to take you through uh, the, the program uh, the program, as I'm sure he's going to tell you, it looks out five years, but we have a heavy focus on the funding and uh, projects that are in the in the upcoming budget year. So, Julian, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, so, again, I'm going to present um, the proposed capital improvement program for uh, fiscal year 23-24 through 27-28. Um, as the city manager mentioned, it's a it's a five-year plan. 
Um, and when this comes back to you at a subsequent meeting, we'll be asking for you to adopt this plan um, and allocate the funds for the next fiscal year. So for 23-24, um, the years two through uh, five are shown for planning purposes only. You're not actually allocating those funds um, in the future years, only for the uh, upcoming year. Um, so the capital improvement program is divided. We divide our projects into three different categories, streets and drainage and utilities, uh, buildings, those are public buildings, and then our parks. Um, and then uh, for the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to divide the projects into three different status. We've got completed projects. So those are ones that will not roll over um, into the next capital improvement program. All the funding, all the work um, should be completed by June 30th of this year. Um, so they'll be completed. We have ongoing projects. So unlike the um, the regular city budget where we start with a new set of funds each July 1st. In the capital program, we have projects that can carry their funding over from fiscal year to fiscal year. They're ongoing uh, projects and we identify how much money we spend per fiscal year. Um, but if a project has money allocated to it, like for example, the bridge project lasted four years. So it had four years of funding uh, up front, and then it carried funding over um, into subsequent years. And then we have a handful of new projects that um, you haven't seen before, um, or they were not included um, in last year's adoption of the CIP budget, but they have been included through, through amendments throughout the year, but we show them as new projects uh, because they weren't included in last year's presentation. Um, so the first is a list of completed projects. So again, what you're going to see here is a lot of what I went over in our department overview. Um, this is some of our park projects, the LED lights, Doherty Drive, and a lot of our paving projects. So for these projects that you see listed here, the work is completed. Um, we will close the books out on these projects. Um, and then we do a cleanup uh, budget resolution. Um, either just before the end of the fiscal year or the beginning of the next fiscal year. So if one of these projects still has money in it and we didn't spend it all, it gets deallocated from the project and it goes back to the fund to be used on another project. Um, or if a project um, went over budget, then the first thing we do is try to borrow money from or transfer money from one of the other projects that went under um, or we have to do an amendment to, to add funds. But we do that separate. These are completed from the actual budget adoption process. Um, the next list is the ongoing projects. And I have these in two different categories. One is ongoing projects that um, need additional funding in the upcoming fiscal year. So the projects you've seen before, they were included in last year's um, capital improvement program. Um, and they're projected to need to carry over into 23-24, uh, and we have identified that there's additional funding needs for those projects. Sometimes that additional need is because the project was set up to be phased, and we um, set it up to add money each subsequent fiscal year, um, and sometimes it's additional money became available to enhance that project, and so we want to add the funds to it. Um, and sometimes it's the cases that um, the initial estimate underestimated um, what the actual project costs are going to be, and we want to add funds so that we can uh, build the project. And so uh, this first one is a park sign improvement. So this is allocating money to complete the installation of the park signs throughout all the parks. So this is a project we funded a little bit each year to get the park sign installations going. Um, and now we're in year four of that program and we want to complete the rest of the park signs. So that's uh, an allocation of uh, 46,000 of park development that we're proposing. The next is public stairs improvements. This is an older project and um, it only has one staircase left to retrofit based on the original program. Uh, but the costs have gone way up since this project was uh, first developed in 2014. And so we need another $20,000 to uh, finish that last improvement. Uh, the next one is the next section of the North-South Greenway um, that I mentioned. So uh, this is allocating uh, just over a million dollars in a federal grant um, that TAM and the city received uh, to complete this project. So this was in your budget before um, as a funded project, but um, as this has um, sat on the sidelines waiting for the recent Caltrans project to finish, 
the costs have gone up and up and up. So TAM was looking for additional funding and fortunately they were able to uh, find some local partnership program grant, which is uh, part of the um, SB1. Um, so since the city will be implementing that project, it will be in our capital program um, and we'll be adding that million dollar grant money into our capital program for this project. Uh, Julian, I just, sorry, two quick questions. Um, I believe the public stairs, um, which public stairs are they? And then also on the park signs, I've seen a bunch of them out of the 11 parks, how many are left that need replacement? Um, there is about half of them are left. Um, so uh, Centennial, uh, Piper, um, the Hillview Greenway, the uh, Doherty Park that's um, downtown um, are the ones that are left. Uh, Niven, Bonner Landing, Hamilton neighborhood um, have been completed already. Okay. And the stairs? You may have missed one somewhere. Yeah, they, they look really good. Yeah. And the stairs are? are uh, the stairs, this was a program that was adopted back in 2014, and there were a handful of stairs that were identified for improvements. The last one to be um, improved is Shady Lane. Uh, there's a staircase at the end of Shady Lane that has no railing. So, so there today, very steep. Yeah. So it needs a railing, um, and we have one in the works, uh, but it needs another $20,000 to install it. Um, and then uh, Redwood Highway. So the next one is crosswalk improvements. So you adopted a crosswalk policy for the city. And as we always try to do when we have these master plans or we adopt a policy, we like to follow it up with actually doing something that was identified in the policy. So you funded a first round of crosswalk improvements. Um, the Transportation Authority of Marin recently came out with um, um, funding um, call for projects for their uh, vehicle registration fee. So they're going to do this every five years. Uh, and so the amount that was available was 152000 for us. Um, and it has to be used uh, towards a project that's uh, already been identified in your capital improvement program. Uh, so it seemed logical to add this money to the crosswalk improvement uh, program to add some more crosswalks uh, that have been previously identified. So this round of crosswalk improvements will likely include some pedestrian level lighting at some of the lower lit crosswalks, um, as well as if you're familiar with the intersection of El Portal and Via Casitas, there's some um, there's some stop signs on some of the legs and not on the others, and there's no actual crosswalk there. So um, we've had a traffic consultant look at ways to improve uh, crosswalks at that intersection. At, at the crosswalk at Doherty in front of the police station, I noticed the flashing lights have been completed. Will those be a standard thing or just at certain crosswalk intersections of high usage? Yeah, so based on the crosswalk uh, policy, there's certain locations where those are appropriate and it's typically uh, has to be a higher volume road. Like that one. Um, has to be more than two lanes. So the left turn lane there qualifies that for the uh, flashing beacons. Um, and then um, there has to be a certain amount of pedestrian traffic um, at that location. Uh, there's a number of other factors too. Okay. Um, yeah, but that it's certain uh, triggers uh, for those flashing lights. Um, the next is the upper Elm pathway. So we've done a preliminary design for this and the cost estimate is quite a bit more um, than we initially anticipated. Um, so we're asking that you allocate $200,000 and this request is for measure B funds. So this um, uh, was one of three projects uh, that we presented to the Measure B Oversight Committee, which has a new name, but I think they were still the Measure B Oversight Committee at the time we met with them um, for projects and, and ways to spend Measure B uh, money that was beyond what we had additionally identified. And so this is the first of those uh, projects that uh, the committee um, agreed with staff's recommendation to propose Measure B funding. Well, um, well one of the first um, plans be in a set... Um an assessment, uh, a survey of the lot of the city owned land there. I know it hasn't been surveyed just to see how much of that pathway is. For the Elm pathway, we yeah. have had it surveyed. Oh, yes. you have? Okay. Yeah. I haven't seen any sticks out there. Yep. So, um, yeah, because the property line is not always where yeah. the fence line is. Because the lower Elm uh, pathway had that weird configuration years ago where they someone had built their um, pool deck onto the public pathway. So just wondering if we're having that same problem. Um, that I don't know yet, but as we get further into the detailed design, uh, if that's an issue, it'll come up. Um, 
The next, this is our annual project where we identify smaller level projects, um, such as I give the example of a 88 uh, handicap ramp. If we get a request for one of those at a certain location, or if there's a minor improvement to a bike lane or, or sidewalk that's city responsibility, we use this project uh, to fund those smaller projects that are a little bit bigger than what our maintenance crew would typically handle, but they're not big enough to have a full-blown capital project just for that improvement. So um, it's kind of a, a, a catch-all for the for the smaller um, improvements that we need to make. Um, so those are your carryover projects where we're going to be asking for uh, funding in 23-24. Uh, this next list is your carryover projects that don't need any more funding. Uh, so they're just continuing um, into the next fiscal year. You already allocated sufficient funding to complete these projects previously. Uh, and these projects will just bring that funding over with them um, into the next fiscal year. So I'll move into the new projects. And uh, some of these are not entirely new because you've seen them with a mid-year budget adjustment, but we label them as as new for the for this purpose because they weren't included in last year's presentation of the capital improvement program so you'll see we've got it's kind of odd we've got some new projects but we're not asking for funding because you already funded them with it with a mid-year and so we'll start with our building projects so the larkspur library at the commons um, is in the budget book for the first time it was added as a mid-year budget um, adjustment um, this is split into two different projects the first here the 101 project is the access uh, the second project is the actual library structure, and these are split into two projects because of the funding that's involved. Um, so there's a grant that's paying for the access. There's a separate grant that we spoke about earlier and the Commons Foundation's uh, matching funds that are paying for the building. So that's why these are split into two. Um, and the access um, is anticipated to be about a million dollars. That's reconfiguring Rose Lane and where the driveway will go into uh, the library parcel and adding some uh, parking on the west side of, of Rose Lane and that little sliver of land that the city owns um, across from where the library will go. Uh, the library itself has the 2.232 million, so that's 5.2 of the uh, state grant and then the five million um, that the commons had raised at the point where we made this uh, budget adjustment. Um, and then, as I mentioned, there's an RFQ out now we anticipate um, going through that process through September or so of this year and then getting a, a design bid team on board um, and then construction starting um, early to mid 2024 and then a library opening late 25. Um, and then these are two projects that uh, we asked you to fund as we were moving forward with the library and we were considering um, building a city offices at the same time and we said we needed some money to uh, undertake that study to see if it was feasible. Um, and so we have pivoted with these projects and so um, the RFQ that has uh, gone out for the library is going to ask the uh, design build teams, uh, what would it cost to add some multi-use community space at the same time as we're building the library? Um, and so we're keeping these projects here. We've just changed the name instead of uh, the city hall at the commons, which is what we had envisioned back when we started these projects. We're changing this to community space at the commons. Um, so these two projects were set up purely for the upfront work that's needed to get that feedback from the design build team on what it's going to cost. Uh, we're not asking you to fund any construction or anything beyond just that preliminary work at this time. So we're leaving these items in the budget and we're just changing the name from City Hall to Community uh, Space so we can keep that effort, um, keep that effort moving forward. Um, and then the last one here is um, Larkspur Library landscaping. Again, uh, because of the grants that we have, don't pay for landscaping. And we anticipate we're going to want some sort of outdoor features, landscaping and hardscaping with the library. We've set up a separate uh, project to facilitate that. We know the Commons Foundation have told us they're raising money for this effort. So, uh, But we're leaving it unfunded at the moment um, until we get a little bit further on in the process and we kind of see what the needs and the funding levels are, but we do want to get it um, in the CIP um, as an approved project. Um, so that's it. So there's where the library is going. There's actually five separate for accounting purposes, mainly projects that were uh, running at that site. 
the next one, as we mentioned uh, earlier, is the Dolliver Park rebuild. Um, so as you recall, we did get a private donation to um, build new uh, children play structure at that park. And unfortunately, it, it did suffer a significant damage from a street tree on Madrone. Uh, that fell through the equipment. And so uh, we've committed to rebuilding that park. Um, and so this is uh, proposed to use a general fund reserve. Uh, we anticipate it's going to cost up to 100,000, hopefully a little less than that, um, to rebuild the playground. Um, and this is a complete rebuild. The way that the tree hit the um, the structure, it's the foundations are, are broken too. So it's um, it's a complete rebuild. Um, one uh, thing of note here is uh, FEMA have extended the winter storm declaration to cover um, the event that led to this um, incident. Uh, we're just waiting now for Marin County to be officially added to the list of counties that are included in that federal disaster. And then this incident, along with a whole bunch of other trees that we lost, would then be eligible for uh, FEMA reimbursement. Um, so we've got it allocated for general fund reserve as of now, but we're hopeful that this will get reimbursed with uh, FEMA money and then that will um, eliminate the need to use city funds on it. Uh, Piper Park parking lot, as I mentioned before, um, we're proposing to use vehicle impact fee um, to uh, start an assessment of what the repaving of that parking lot would look like. It's in very bad condition. The underlying soils are probably about as bad as they could be anywhere. It's built on top of an old dump. Um, so we wanna make sure um, that we get it engineered properly and we rebuild it and it's not gonna end up looking again like it does today. There's drainage issues um, out there that we know about. Um, and as you mentioned, we can um, look and make sure that while we're rebuilding everything, we have it in, the, in, a, in a format that uh, is most economical for getting as many parking spaces as, as we can. So um, this is probably gonna be a big number. It's probably gonna be close to half a million dollars when we're all said and done and looking at what it's actually gonna cost to rebuild it. But uh, we're only asking you to fund the engineering analysis now so we can come back to you and let you know uh, what that's going to cost. Um, as you know, we probably get about $100,000 in uh, money for parks from the county park measure A each year. So, you know, we're definitely going to be thinking about um, alternate funding mechanisms for this because we don't really want to spend five years of money that we could use to improve parks in a, in a parking lot, but it's definitely a need. So um, we're, we'll be coming back to you with some funding um, ideas for that um, in the future. Julian, is there any possibility for Measure B money being used there? Um, I mean, I'd have to think about that. I think the you know the entrance way in is is could be classified as a as a as a street. I think once you get into the parking lot, I haven't I haven't really got to that point yet. Um, because we do have a surplus there, right? There was a surplus and we have taken some projects to use a, a portion of that. I will channel the committee. I think the oversight committee would balk. Now that doesn't mean you can't do it because you are the ultimate say, but I don't know the parking lot meets what you conveyed to the voters were the priorities for measure B. Um, but we'll, we'll, we will come with a plan for this. This is a this is a priority, so we'll figure it out. Yeah, I, I'm just. I think the conversation. I, I wouldn't want to. You know, if the oversight committee has good arguments, I'm just curious. You know, it's we were talking about having money that can't be spent, and here we have a somewhat unfunded liability. And so, well, well, we have money we can't spend because Julian can't find people to take it. Not that he and I don't want to see it spent. So. Understood. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so the next project on the list here is, again, this is a carryover project. When we completed the storm drain master plan, uh, we came back uh, with an amendment, asked you to amend the CIP to let us start working on the first storm drain project. And so uh, you funded that with $740,000 of ARPA money. So um, that's a carryover project that you pre-funded um, last year. Um, so no funding this year. Um, and then here are two new storm drain projects. So we mentioned the Heatherwood or Heather Garden storm drain pump station before. 
Uh, Ross Valley, this is a kind of unique situation where both the uh, city's storm drain pump station and Ross Valley's sewer pump station are actually in the same building, which you would never do today, but that's the way it was done. Um, and so Ross Valley have identified a need to replace their pump station completely. Um, it doesn't meet their standards anymore, and it is a, a service nightmare. And we pretty much have the same issue. And so we're going to work together with Ross Valley. And the proposal is we're both going to build our own pump stations right next to each other on the same site. And then there's some economies of scale there. Uh, we can use the same engineer and we can share some of the common features between them without having their sewage flow into our storm drain and our storm drain flow into their um, sewer system. So um, for this project is another one of the uh, the projects that we proposed to the Measure B uh, committee. So this is a big chunk. This is about a $2.3 million project and about 1.9 of that is, is proposed to be uh, Measure B uh, with the remainder uh, of the two types of gas tax. Um, so this project, um, if funded, will be uh, moving forward jointly with RVSD, and we may at some point in the future come back to you with an agreement to determine exactly how that works and whether they actually take the project over and we reimburse them or vice versa, or whether we work together to a point um, and then we just hire one contractor um, in the end, yet to be uh, determined. Um, and then the next is kind of a follow up to the first storm drain project. So this is using the remaining ARPA money as soon as I possibly can uh, to do the next round of storm drain improvements. Um, so there's just over a million dollars of ARPA that hasn't been allocated yet uh, by the city. Uh, there's more of that that hasn't been spent, uh, but this allocates the remaining ARPA money to fixing the next uh, priority level of uh, storm drain repairs that we identified. The need's a little bit more than that. So we've actually allocated some, um, some gas tax and then also asked uh, Measure B for the committee for $500,000 of, of Measure B to uh, take a good chunk out of our storm drain needs. Julian, quick question. On, um, back to the pump station. I think we have six in the city, right? And, and is is the the possible partnership with Ross Valley what's driving us to start with that one? Or is that based on... Yeah. This is an opportunity. Heatherwood was uh, one of the top three to be done. It's not actually the one that's in the worst um, condition, but um, the opportunity to do a joint project with uh, Ross Valley is what uh, trumped it over the other ones to the uh, first position. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the next slide is kind of everything that I've been through, but in a numbers format. Um, so what this does is it lists all of the projects. So the first or the second column on the on the left is the name of each project. And then as you go across, it lists each of the proposed funding sources for each of the projects. So you can see what uh, buckets of money we're proposing to use for um, each of these projects. Um, and then if you want to know how much of each of the funds are proposed to be spent throughout the year, then um, they're summed at the bottom. Um, so. Um, unless anybody has any questions, um, I will just jump ahead to the next slide, which, again, this is just the allocation. So this is the money that if you adopt the capital budget at the next meeting, uh, these are the allocations you would be making to these projects at that time. The next slide um, goes through these projects, but shows you what we're um, planning for the five-year window in the capital plan. Um, and again, I've highlighted here the, the column in, in color is if you're allocating money this year um, and then the out years, you're not allocating now, but we're just uh, giving you a, 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 a foreshadowing of what we will likely come back with in subsequent years to ask you for. So again, uh, the first page here is the building projects. So there's no money identified for this year. Um, we're showing some money for next year because we know some of these projects will need more money. Um, for example, we've shown you a community space that the commons are only, only funding the design work and the preliminary work to now. Um, if it's determined that we want to move ahead with something like that, it's going to need some funding in the future years. So we've got a placeholder here. You're not approving that money at this time. We're just showing you that this project would need more money if we needed um, to complete it in the future. Uh, second category is parks. So for this one, 
Uh, we're scheduled to go to the Parks and Rec Commission uh, to present the preliminary budget as it pertains to park projects tomorrow. So uh, we'll get their feedback and we'll be able to incorporate their feedback into your budget item when we come back June 7th. Um, but this is what we're thinking for parks projects at the moment. Again, the allocations we've talked about previously for this year, and then looking at what parks projects will be up next over the next um, five years. So doing another phase at Heatherwood, doing some improvements out of Green Bay School Park, uh, doing some improvements to the greenways uh, throughout town. And then, you know, as Nick Stone mentioned, we're gonna be looking at a Piper Park master plan. So we're gonna uh, plug some money into the CIP to start doing some of those uh, first priorities that I identified with the, with the master plan. And then the last is the streets, which is the biggest category it has most of our projects in. And again, the same here, the bold is uh, what we'll be asking you to allocate at the budget hearing. And then years uh, two through five is how we see these projects being funded um, in subsequent years. And then the last piece is our unfunded projects. So again, I emphasize these. These are projects that have not been fully vetted uh, with the community. They're projects that came about because we had a study that identified we have a need or we had a community that has been asking for a certain um, improvement over time. Um, they're not prioritized. There's very little engineering or analysis that's been done on these. They have rough order of magnitude costs. Um, so you'll see on here, there's some things that we know we're definitely going to have to do it sometime. Both fire stations are on this list. Uh, we know we're going to have to do some work. Um, these numbers that you see here will get updated as the fire district goes through their process of evaluating um, their needs. Um, the retrofit of this building, we're showing, you know, the, the last number that we presented to you. Um, again, we're not saying we're going to do a $17 million project there. We're just saying that we've had discussions before and there's a potential for a $17 million um, project here. Um, and then going on through the list, you've got some improvements at Piper Park, um, College Avenue, Woodland Intersection. Um, so there's things, some things on here that will rise up over time as funding becomes available or, you know, as we've mentioned before, if the elevator breaks in here, then one of those projects pops off that list and we have to do something about it. Um, I think that's the last slide. So I'm available for any questions or Dan, if you have anything to add. I was just gonna add on the fire stations uh, for the benefit of the members of the council who don't attend our fire council meeting. Um, so the, the fire authority commissioned a study, you can review it, it's on their website of the conditions of the fire stations and some of the deficiencies and service delivery challenges that each of its of the four stations uh, present. We're now in a phase two and uh, actually in the process of signing a contract with a firm called CityGate. And what they'll do now is do a, what's called a standard of coverage analysis. So that, that will look at, given the four locations, uh, what is the appropriate allocate, allocation of resources to maximize the areas of coverage for the city? And it'll take into account our partnership with Kentfield, for example, who covers portions of Larkspur as part of our partnership. So um, when that study's done, then the authority will have the means to engage the fire council in, in sort of what are the priorities and how are we next going to talk to the communities of Larkspur and Corte Madera about what needs to be done. Okay, uh, any questions for um, our public works director? Julian, just um, of the five mitigation projects, the uh, dog park, the dock, the Hillview Greenway, looks like we're almost done with dog park. What what comes next? Uh, the pump station is done. Yeah, so the, the dog park is probably should... within about a month or so of being completed. Canine Commons. I remember that was a right. name we gave it a while ago. Yeah. Um, and then uh, they're working on the Magnolia Avenue uh, ditch right. at the moment. Um, the Hillview Greenway improvements were actually dropped from the mitigation uh, project. Uh, when they did the final calculations, they found out that the just widening and planting the ditch next to Magnolia was sufficient to capture the water to yeah, yeah to um, account for the the clean cleaning of the water that we needed to do for the bridge right. uh, footprint. Uh, Bonaire Landing Park is almost complete. Um, also, um, all of the concrete is in. The only thing that's remaining is the ADA handrails uh, for all of the ADA ramps, and then the dock. 
uh, as well as the dock over next to the Marin Rowing Club dock. There's a that's it. Then. There's a public dock over there. Those two docks are long lead items. They're being fabricated offsite. Oh. Um, so what we imagine is you'll see the contractor here probably for about another two or three weeks finishing up on Magnolia and at the dog park. Um, then they are likely to demobilize. And then when the docks are ready, they'll float the two docks in probably towards the end of summer and install the docks. And then on September 1st, uh, when the Ridgeway rail is no longer a concern, uh, you will see them return and demolish the old dog park and turn it into a tidal marsh. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Okay, any other questions? All right, Julian, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. So uh, I forgot up. about the public yeah. again. Any questions from, from the... Uh, Viewers on Zoom. I don't think we have anyone in the audience here. You do have uh, some raised hands. The okay. first comment will come from James Holmes. Okay. Uh, yes, James. Uh, James Holmes, Larkspur. My concern relates to the hundred thousand dollars proposed for uh, repair of the Dolliver Park tot lot. First, um, I should note that Public Works seems to have done a terrific job in in repairing the damage and restoring the structure to some degree. Uh, the, admittedly, I, I, I just drive by it, but the pot, uh, the uh, tot lot seems to be in use, and uh, there are a lot of play structures that are still intact and in use. Um, the tot lot was privately financed, and uh, in light of that and the fact that it's still so much intact and in use, and that the $100,000 is such a tremendous sum, and uh, there are so many other uh, needs, uh, I would suggest that we not spend the money to totally restore uh, the tot lot at this time. Uh, possibly some uh, other less expensive play features might be added, or possibly some other parents might like to uh, contribute, uh, that would be great. But let's save the $100,000 uh, for, for something else. This, this uh, what, uh, facility was uh, nice to have freebie, and it really shouldn't be a burden now. Uh, and, and I also do wonder about the $46,000 for the signs. Unlike some of the other projects, I mean, there's, there are signs here now uh, which, are, uh, which are, are still present. Uh, so uh, perhaps that $46,000 is something else that could be deferred or placed on a, on a lower priority if we don't have enough funds to go around. Thank you. Thank you, James. Um, do we have any other public comment, Allison? Yes, next speaker will be Rick Flowers. Yes, um, yesterday um, I attended the Municipal Water Department board meetings, and um, they're going to raise the rates about 100% over the next couple of years and more if there's a drought. And so I would suggest that you uh, allocate funding for a study on how we can water all our parks with recycled secondhand water um get that study started so that you can figure out how to do it a lot of communities are doing that and there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to do that and um also all the parking lots um mentioned in the budget um i think we could um do a study to find out how we can get um, third parties to put up solar parking, uh, solar arrays over the parking lots, um, basically renting them the land to make the money on the solar. And that way, and eventually we will get money from that. And also to install um, electric vehicle charging on all those parking lots we're going to be developing um and i think they can get outside money to fund a lot of those electric charging stations too so um those would be my proposals that you put in this budget study some about how to do those things and the next time you get together you can decide whether you want to do it but if you don't study it you won't know 
So thank you. Thank you, Rick. Any other comments, Allison? Okay, so thanks again, um, Julian. And uh, this includes uh, all our business items number eight. And we'll adjourn now to close session, um, a conference with real property negotiators and reconvene uh, an open session uh, afterwards to announce any reportable actions. So uh, we'll adjourn until we come back from the closed session. Thank you. Uh, welcome back. We are reconvening an open session um, and we have no reportable action from our closed session. And so uh, that brings us to adjournment and uh, referring back to our public comment, I'd like to adjourn again in memory of uh, Sandy Blaufeld, a uh, very valued member of our Larkspur community, someone who will be deeply missed. And with that, uh, we're adjourned and we will be back on Monday for a special session on rent stabilization. Good night, everybody. <laughs>